The Black Family, how are you? Dr. Cambon, how are you? Hello, Black. I'm Black. Dr. Maulana should be coming up the stairs. I just heard the gate open. He's, he's on his way in the door. So he. Uh, let's say, Okay. Now, Mama Julie, I'm not hearing you again. Uh, but if you're still there, if I'm still connected, it's blacktastic to be on Black once again. It's magnificent, black to full, black powerful. Expect black to be with you here again. So definitely appreciate it. Looks like you're here with me still. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a little issue. Um, Move right? Yeah. So, our, our, stream, our stream has been unstable. Okay. How are you? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The black task. Thank you. It's not. Yeah, that's all right. Really? Come in. Yeah. And you ran upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> this thing, man, you know, Doc, is right. I just have to manage it. You know. You know. No, that's my book. It is my book. Can we get you some water? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Maybe a second time, yes. Because okay. I took some uh, medicine and I just still feel like it's in my. Is, is that a boy or a girl? Girl, a Yeah. So there you got one, two, three. Four. Three, three girls and one boy. Oh, Charlie, you gonna hit the next thing? Yeah, you know, we gotta, <laughs> gotta bounce it out. Seven boys, seven girls. But you know, in African society, you know, either they're beautiful. Okay. It's not like the people in India. You know what I mean? We don't want no girl. Yeah, yeah. I, when my when my daughter came, I was jubilant, man. You know, yes. Well, I'm yeah, I'm yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think, Mama, uh, Yimko, my guy, is saying that she is having some streaming problems. So what time is it? It's uh five eleven, and we're live. So I think we are on the show, but we're not hearing her. So I think we may need to wing it until she can get connected well, because I think we're alive and people are looking at us right now. Yeah, you're alive. Yeah, they did. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I find out. You wish Okay, so everybody is watching this right now. So we're here to talk about uh, a little bit of the background to repatriation, as some of you saw in the previous video um, that was shared on Blacksit. Um, here we have a special guest in the house, but not a guest in Ghana. He's been here for decades. We have Dr. Maulana. Maulana, and he is here, you know, representing Ministry of the Future. 
Myself, I'm Okunini Obadile Kanban, and I'm representing Repatriate to Ghana. And together, through the work that we uh, put in, uh, starting right there at African Studies, this is how so many Africans were able to get citizenship in Ghana. And this is basically the blueprint and the model that is now igniting the entire continent. Um, Sister Julia was saying that she got so much inspiration and the Gambia is now looking to do a similar initiative. We hosted the Benin delegation. There again, the African studies, they were able to get their citizenship, looking at the blueprint laid out right there at African studies. So I think, you know, uh, Dr. Maulana will get you started. I spoke uh, previously, I think that was like two weeks ago, but the audience has yet to hear from the man with the plan, Dr. Maulana. So uh, we're live. And over to you with anything you would like to start off. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Obadali uh, Kambon, thank you for arranging the setup. Sister uh, Juliet Ryan, I want to thank you and highlight the fact of the good works that you are doing. And I guess most importantly, I want to thank our ancestors and the most high for giving me and us the strength, the intellect, the perseverance, and to love that we have of Africa and Black people and all humanity. And for that note, I say thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, yes, indeed, this is a wonderful historic journey that we have started here in Ghana. Ghana made history, and along with us, we made history. It had never been done before on the African continent where a sitting government acknowledged the children, the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, and said, you are not foreigners. You are not strangers. You do not have to have a citizenship. Your citizenship was taken away from you 400 years ago. And now you are here and we are giving you the right to return. Now that didn't come about just by a process of osmosis. It came about because someone or someone's had a dream someone were making a sacrifice of themselves for the benefit of the masses. So the long and the short of all of that is simply this. Uh, let me just pick up with the Institute of African Studies. I believe this was the significant platform. Even though I was carrying the portfolio, of getting a citizenship, but we needed a platform where we could actually break down and set up an educational outreach program that would be sustainable and consistent on educating not only the Africans of the diaspora, but educating continental Africans as well. And of course, it brings to mind uh, my dear brother, Dr. Obadele Kambal. He been there as a senior fellow at the Institute of African Studies. We went to his office and we got a very warm reception and we utilized that particular conference room in and around his office to build, if you will, the building blocks. Because the road for getting, get, getting government, let me just say this, to have an African government to say okay to your request. I mean, it, it's not easy to do. You got to go and come, go and come, go and come. And the thing about it, whenever you do come, if you will, or go to the high offices, you have to have your portfolio intact. You can't go there and say, you know, oh, I left the application, I left this, I'll be back tomorrow. No, you got one time, per se, to go into that gate or door. And you got to be ready. And you really have to know, you have to know the diplomacy, because diplomacy is extremely important 
international relations, when you get up to the level of dealing with, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but it's a fact. Uh, our, our, our governments here are really bidding the colonial powers of uh, jurisprudence that they left them. And, 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 that, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the colonial powers had, had and still do not have any consideration whatsoever of what happened to us. So by virtue of that, African governments themselves uh, were like insensitive, not sensitized to the suffering that we have. Now I also want to qualify that point because many of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora do not understand, uh, you know, are angry over the fact that we spent 400 years in captivity and, and caught and still today are catching hell. But you have to understand, slavery did not start in the United States of America, in Jamaica, the Caribbean, or Brazil, or UK. It started here. So what I'm trying to say, it was a duality of nefarious behavior and suffering. Meaning that the first impact of suffrage and suffering started right here on the African continent. And it left a deep, deep, deep wound. The only thing that saved the African on the continent, per se, is due to the fact that the African on the continent was organized with a chieftaincy in place, had their mother tongue, and of course the cultural mores that are embedded in that, that kept the flame you know, alive in their mind to, to endeavor to go forward no matter what the odds were. But whereas us who were thrown into these slave ships, slave dungeons, we lost our mother tongue, uh, we lost our culture, and we were in a state of oblivion. You understand? And so it would be a journey where we would have to endeavor for the next 400 to 500 years to get a footing to know who we are. And what you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking today at a people, a special people. And I want to say this with deep emphasis. The African descendants of the transatlantic slave trade are a special people, and the world knows this. Europeans know this, that we are special. And the best way that I deal with this is to say, having gone through the 400 years to 500 years really of captivity and suffrage, suffering as we have done and able enough to yet come out with intellect, with resilience, and then take leadership, you know what I mean, with, without feeling at least visibly the wounds that have been inflicted upon us. Now, if that had been a white race, and we know what happened to the Indian race, the red race. They were, <laughs> they were virtually totally annihilated. But the African, because of the fact Mother Africa, our DNA, we are the original people of this planet Earth. We were the first begotten that the Creator put on this Earth. And we shall be the last that leave this Earth if any of us are going to leave. We were the first and we shall be here the day after whatever goes down. And so by virtue of that, that being embedded in our DNA, I began to feel that. And when I arrived on the continent almost about 50 years ago, and I could see over the period of time, many efforts of the diaspora with the love that we have for the continent. Now when I say diaspora, I'm going to come in and emphasize periodically, Africans of the diaspora, I'm not talking about the others. I'm talking about descendants of the 400, excuse me, descendants of the 400 years transatlantic slave trade. Now we have to understand, the reason I put an emphasis on that and talk about the descendants of the 400 year transatlantic slave trade is extremely important because what is happening right now, the Europeans with America, they know the issue of reparations is really in the pipeline. And so obviously they don't want to pay. And what they have done over the last 
let's say five to 10 years, they have worked out a scheme to identify Africans of the diaspora as continental Africans who actually, because of political and economic problems on the continent, fled to Europe and other parts of the world, America, and classified them as the African diaspora. And therefore, any time any um, officialdom is mentioned of African diaspora in the United Nations, the international arena, these people have championed that to say, oh, they're talking about the Africans on the continent, not the Africans in the uh, uh, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. And so we have to be clear about that. And I say proudly, we have been able to bring that along with Dr. Kambon and I, we, we, we have been able to bring that to the forefront. Dr. Kambon did, did a paper on that in, I think, 2016. He followed up with other documents. I did a 20-sheet paper on that to show the importance of who we are and that we are the original, the original African diaspora that the world has known for hundreds of years is the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, having said that, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, here would be the issue. Coming back home, now, coming back home, the African doesn't see in the deepest uh, recesses of his mind, particularly government, that we have an entitlement to come back home. Now, many of us in the diaspora, because this, this is what we feel, we're so passionate about the continent, we felt because we are black, we are the descendants, that we should be able to walk in here and have no problems. We have an, it's an entitlement for us to do that. But then when you get here, it would be a different, especially about 35, 40 years ago, it would be a different situation altogether. And I'm saying that to say, brothers and sisters today, if you see the year of return and beyond the return, welcoming you warmly back to the continent, I want to say it again. It didn't happen through a process of osmosis that African government had to change about and became soft and understanding about that. that. The change of their attitude, the change of their mindset to know who we are, this comes as a result of those of us of the African diaspora who have come here and who have been laboring. Look, I live in Guinea Bissau and I have been crocodiles 16 feet long, have been stepping at my feet on the ravines coming from a, a, a Zegan shore of southern Senegal to get into Guinea Bissau. And I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. I have had yellow, yellow fever three times. I've had jaundice five times. I've had malaria. I lost count of how many times I got malaria. So we have paid a deep price. But you know, the price is not the factor because what is the cause is what we are representing. And in our minds, those of us who are committed, we are not trying to get it for our generation. We're looking for the generations that are going to come after us. And as long as you are selflessly pursuing this, that for the generations and the children that are coming after you and the children, children, believe me, doors will open for you. So we had to sensitize the African government. Look, many people probably know me from the W.E.B. Du Bois Center for Pan-African Culture. I established in 1990 an educational outreach program at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center. And I tell you, and I'm not joking, consecutively, I have that program, even when we started, we started under the tree, Nim Tree, where that was the classroom right there in the courtyard of the Du Bois Center for the first couple of years under the Nim tree. And, I, and, the, and the students that were coming were basically mostly Ghanaians and other Af continental Africans who were visiting here, who were pan-African oriented, but for 17 consecutive years. And of course, realizing that that 17 years was causing like a tsunami fallout within the, uh, the, the halls of government. They began to know what I was doing there. Many of them would come, even one of the former presidents, I won't call his name, a former president 
came to one of my classes at the Du Bois Center before he became president. The minister, the former minister, deputy minister of finance was one of my basic students there. And so they, they were being sensitized. They were saying, look, man, we had no idea. In our Ghana educational service system, they never told us about what our brothers and sisters went through in the diaspora. And the things that you're talking about, uh, Brother Moana, or what happened to our people and what is still happening to our people, we didn't have a clue. It was only when you began to teach that at the divorce center, and it was consistent, come rain or shine. You know what I mean? I was there every week, every week, sometimes twice a week. And I was there on a voluntary basis. I didn't get one penny of Pesqua. That never crossed my mind. All the little resources that I had, I injected that into the educational outreach program. And the long and the short of that, realizing that one day it's going to bear fruit. And yes, all of these uh, uh, officials who became government officials that used to come to my class, once they did get into office, then I began to, Charlie, <laughs> now you're in office, you know, I come to get my two. And so we know that one, Ni Kwesi Kwate, who is now the vice chairman of the African Union. And Dr. Campbell can verify this fact because he's been with me on it. Me, was, uh, uh, he was appointed in 2015 the executive secretary to His Excellency, the President, John Dramani Muhammad at the time. And that was a door, that was a window open for us. You see how merciful and blessing the ancestors are here you have a situation, someone that I knew and had a, you know, like a friendship relationship with the person that used to come to my classes, but now is in a high seat of power. And when I saw that, I said, look, coming back to what I said at the outset, it just pained me to see Africans of the diaspora who have been coming and going. Our people have brought monies to this, to Ghana. I lived in Senegal. I lived in the Gambia. I've seen over the I've lived in Mali. I lived in Visa. I've seen over the decades that Africans, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, would bring their last peswa or penny to inject into the economies of this country because they love it. I call it love investment. Our people would just, and our people didn't have no citizenship. Many of the people that were coming on visas that were uh, limited to 30 days, immigration policy didn't have no consideration that you are African descended. They looked at you as a white man and America, and you have to toe the line like others do. But our people, yet yeah, were coming. Our people were buying land, being duped, and then had no sovereign right to defend themselves. Because if you come to another country, even if you love it, you put your resources there and you're not a citizen and you don't have legal papers, you know what I mean, in event? Because let me tell you, on both sides of the Atlantic, we got fast-talking eddies. When I say fast-talking eddies, you got those who are looking to swindle you. We got some here, just like we got some over there. And if you come, and this happened to many of our people, who have put their resources, their last resources, into investment and then had a conflict, had a difference with their associate or partner here. And then the partner realized that you're in a weak position. You're not even a citizen. You don't even have your paperwork. They could run down to the immigration office and report you within 24 to 48 hours. <laughs> the police come in to deport you from land and all of your investments have gone over to fast talking Eddie or fast talking Kwame. So I realized that, and I said, one of the first things we have to do, we got to get a sovereign right, you know what I mean, to have a sovereign right to be here. And of course, that is tantamount to citizenship. So that's when in 2015, when the former executive secretary, Nee Quincy Quarter, became to the president, I say, this is the time to go. And I realized when I did go to the president's office, the president said he had been looking at many, many of my programs. 
And he had been following that over the years. So it opened up the door. And believe me, I can just say this. And at the time that this door was open, uh, let me just say, one, let me back up a moment. The, the door was open, but now there had to be work done. The work had to be done to fan out in the society, reach out to the African diaspora, and that is when we bring in Dr. Cam Paul and the Institute of African Studies. So I lost count. Dr. Cam Paul, he's the archivist. He probably has archived all of the meetings we had. We had so many meetings at, at, the, at the Institute of African Studies. But those meetings, they were very enriching. Those meetings was really conscientizing. Not only our people here on what we needed to do. We needed to come together. We needed to unite. But it also was getting sending a signal back to government that we are here. We are here to stay. We're not tourists. We are not coming here as tourists. We are a part and parcel of this land. We did not volunteer to leave. We were illegally, we were kidnapped. And therefore, we are asking of you, my dear father, my dear mother here, my dear brother, my dear sister, you must understand who we are and you must open your door. You must open your door to let us in. We have gained a lot of knowledge by being out there with the different international European Asian communities. Even though they had their knee on our neck, we were still able enough to function with their knee on our neck. And so we also had gained access to a little finance. We also were very educated. And this, you see, what is needed in Africa right now. It is needed that entity of the African diaspora who has had this, this enriching experience with Europeans, white Americans, because you know them, we know them, we know them. They don't have to open their mouth to say nothing. We can pick up them through telepathy, what they're thinking before they even speak. But here on the continent, they have done a job of hoodwinking, bamboozling, and spin doctoring the people here through the educational system, where many of our people, and I'm very sorry to say that, mm -hmm believe that the white man is God. Have such a mindset that they believe he's God. So, you know, these particular walls and barriers, they have to be broken. And this would me over the 17 years at the Boys Center. I was taking no prisoners on this particular subject. I was breaking the walls on that to let them know these people are not gods. These people are thieves. These people are murderers. These people are rogues. These people have everything they got in their coffers, be it in Britain, the USA, France, uh, Germany, Spain, Portugal. They have come and they have stolen it from this continent. And you don't know that because they sent the missionaries here to really center, sanitize the evil that they did. Even the word, we have a word here well, Doc may take issue with me on that word, so I won't bring it up because he's a linguist. But I was going to say the word old Bruni. You understand what I'm saying? But I, I researched it at the village level. I went all the way to the village through the, the tree speaking people in the interior. I went all the way to the village, to the area, people, all the way to the Bota. I went to the Adangbe, and I also went to the houses speaking. And when I was in Senegal, the word Tuba. I went to find out how did they come up with these particular, they came up with these particular uh, adjectives and description of these people by virtue of the people's bad behavior. And so I'm saying here, the situation is that the Europeans, rather than to allow the educational system and the subject here to know the evil that they did, they sent the missionaries here to sanitize the evil by teaching the children in the school that, oh, they're not executioners like a brothel. They're not uh, I -E -E tricky, like a tricky dog in every, way. or they're not like in a dangbe, Pablo Fono, uh, someone that pretends to be helping you but actually is killing you. So the missionaries sanitize that 
and then they come out with Obroni. And of course, we know that Obroni has two uh, different lines of, if you will, definition. You know what I mean? But nevertheless, the Europeans didn't want our people here to call them what they should have been called, and that was executioners. And that's exactly what the chiefs and the Omahines, when they first met them, when they came in in 1471, they initially realized. Now, I'm not saying the chief did not cooperate with them, because I would be a liar to say that there was not, you know what I mean, interface and intercourse between the two. Eventually, what I'm telling you, on the initial, on the initial contact, the, the, the let's say the aristocracy of the chieftaincy here did not want to deal with these people because they, they felt that they had leprosy. And they would use the Otami, the middleman between them to talk when they wouldn't shake their hands, whatever. But I'm only saying that to give you a brief to say, by bringing the educational system through the missionaries, they actually were in up to hoodwink, bamboozle, and if you will, uh, spend doctor and cover up all of the atrocities that they have done. And then, da, 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 they say, we are here in the name of our God, the Lord and Savior, to save you. And, you know, and they institutionalize that with religion. I'm not, I'm not coming down on anybody's religion. But what I'm just saying, the missionaries were able enough to sanitize the evil that was done. And this is why when you come here now, you find many of our young brothers and sisters that don't have a clue to what really happened to us. So the long and short of that is, by being in the Institute of African Studies, and mind you, let me just say this also, we're talking about the Institute of African Studies. Now, the first head of state of God, Osage uh, Yepo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Well, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the world knows of him, the millennium man, you know, that he set the Institute of African Studies with a far-reaching vision you know, into the 21st century. And he had the African diaspora, the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade factored into that institution, the concept that it was supposed to be used as an institute of research, analysis, solving problems, bringing our people home, showing the value of our culture, of African people, the antiquities. And I'm saying that to say, and I'm telling you, Doc and I have gone over this, but I've told Doc, I'm going to say, Doc, what we did with the citizenship issue on the platform of the Institute of African Studies, if Osai Jeffrey, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah could look down on us, he would be smiling until eternity, because this was probably on a scale from zero to, let's say, to 100 of the aims, the vision, the aims, and the objectives of that institute, what it was supposed to accomplish. This, what we did, was at the top. This, what we did, we convinced the government of Ghana to open it, its doors to the transatlantic, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, and not to look at us as foreigners not to consider us to go to immigration to get in line with the rest of the nationals of the world and file for citizenship. We convinced the government, and let me just tell you, the, comment, the narrative on that was this. You see, any national has a right to go and get citizenship. Now, I want to differentiate, and I want you to understand there's a big difference between the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade applying citizenship as opposed to our right to return. You see, uh, a German can come to Ghana and apply for citizenship. A white American can come, and they can get it. Well, they become a citizen of Ghana. But for an African descendant of the transatlantic slave trade, that individual must have a right to return by virtue of the fact you were already a part of the soil of this continent, and you were kidnapped. So to restore your right, citizenship alone is not going to do that. To restore your our right, the only way that can be restored 
it has to be bestowed upon us the citizenship along with the right to return. So this was the narrative that Dr. Campbell and I, we pursued this particular narrative. And, and this particular narrative at the Institute of African Studies, as I say again, and I want to put special emphasis on that. Maybe some people have seen it, but I'm going to tell you, this is what he saw. What do you think the Institute of African Studies is about? Go inside and look at many of the projects that have been have unfolded by many of the scholars in there. We were the first ones that went into the annals of history and got to the nerve center of Africa. And the nerve center of Africa was the disruption of the transatlantic slave trade that really took us back into oblivion. We faced that issue and we did it through the Institute of African Studies by educating the government of Ghana and other African governments that we are the lost children who are descendants of the transatlantic slave trade and we are coming back to build and free this continent from the yoke of colonialism. And through the Institute of African Studies, we, it began to resonate. Ghanaians would come to our classes. Uh, <coughs> we even, as Dr. Kamala said, it resonated so deeply, it, it resonated all the way to Benin. Benin sent a delegation here in June, June 24, 2017. We hosted them for, I think, about a day or two. And they wanted to learn the process of what we had done at the Institute of African Studies so they could take it back to the government of Benin and institute it there. And let me tell you, if you do not know, the Institute of African Studies and the platform that we established, it must be understood, in pursuing the right to return, as opposed to just getting Ghanaian citizenship, you got to go back to the annals of history. If you're not a historian, you better become a multi disciplinary, you got to know a lot of different things. And so that is to say, what was the bottom line to convince government to even give us an audience to listen to us? Well, the bottom line was this. We say, Mr. Government or Miss Government of Ghana, we think you have a moral obligation to the children who were taken into slavery. And maybe government say, why do I have a moral obligation? Well, I say, first of all, is this. When you look through the 400-year uh, book of the transatlantic slave trade, and you see the number of slave forts that the Europeans had constructed from Senegal all the way down to Angola. I mean, this is a humongous distance. They constructed 66. There could have more. But I'm just saying for the official, we recognize 66. And we said, Mr. Government of Ghana, how many do you think Ghana had of that 66 that was along the coast from Senegal all the way down to Angola? Ghana had 46. 46 slave ports of the 66 that existed at the peak of slavery. And this is documented by UNESCO in a summary conference in Haiti, Puerto Prince Haiti, in January 1978. And they, and they gave a modest figure of how many died during that 400 year period. And that figure came out of there, what they call Paris. 210 million Africans were murdered during that period. Oh, nobody would wink you and say it was 2 million that went over uh, uh, 3 or 12. And look, this went on for 400 years. And they took the best, the best of the African. No, nobody travels 4,000 miles as a, a slave owner with a slave schooner ship to come and get rotten pineapples, to get rotten potatoes. They want to get the fresh, the most intelligent one. And this is what they did. They gleaned, they gleaned Africa 
of all of this reserved for talent. They gleaned the youth that could have had this continent now to be the Wakanda that it's going to be. They took all of that to America. And of course, we know the result. Who built America? <laughs> Britain, a desolate island in the, in the North Sea, wherever. When, uh, the, the sun never set under their empire. How did that happen? Well, of course, it happened because they came and took the best from here, the mines and the labor. A lot of people think it was just labor. No, 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 no. It was intellect in Africa now. We came out of ancient Canada, Egypt. We came out from Sumer. We came out from kingdoms all the way back to China. Millions of years ago, we've been on this planet. And they knew that. And they, and they knew it. And they gleaned the earth. So I'm just saying that through the Institute of African Studies, we were able to approach this from a two-tier perspective with government in requesting that government give us the right to return. And the first tier was a moral, a moral obligation. And of course, morality or morals is not enough because African governments today, they are suffering just as worse economically and in many instances politically as many of the Africans in the diaspora. So we had to bring another component. The other component is we say, Mr. Government or Ms. Government, we can bring you added value to the UNP. We can bring you billions of dollars. I'm telling you, we wrote, I wrote the paper. I wrote the paper to give this narrative. So it was a two tier narrative front presented to government. One was on the moral high ground that you have a moral responsibility for the slave trade that took place here on the, on the former Gold Coast, which is Ghana today. And the second is, by you giving us our right to return and citizenship, we will bring our money here, our skills here, and put it in the bank here. And moreover, we will act as tourism ambassadors to tell our kid and kin throughout the whole global diaspora that the number one destination you need to visit in Africa is Ghana. I wrote that paper to that effect. And they looked at it and said, damn, yeah, billions can come. And I'm not saying that we should just, you know what I mean, uh, concentrate or focus on finance. But you have to look at the reality, brothers and sisters. If you think that you can come here and just say, well, I went through the slave trade and they took me, they kidnapped me, give me my citizenship, I'm back home. It ain't gonna work. No, it's not gonna work with African governments. They will tell you, well, you get on the next boat, the plane, you go. You got to look at the economic fabric. It may be wrong because we didn't ask to leave, but to come back, we have to bring something to the table. We have to bring some skills. The skill, they, they need skills here. Africa was damaged, as I said at the outset, just as deeply as we were damaged and taken over. Then you have to help to bring finance. But you know, so having said that, this was the narrative that came out of the Institute of African Studies. And I would say, Doc Lee, Institute of African Studies should be clapping day and night for you having that office of yours there because they may not understand. I think they do understand it. What we did, we did a historical, we did a historical fact of things that had never been done on the African continent. Understand this, African governments have given citizenship to the African diaspora. One, 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 you apply. That was something we got. But collectively, in bulk, and so when we went in 2016, coming out of the Institute of African Studies with the portfolio and the narrative that I just mentioned to you a moment ago, we could have gotten as many as 500 citizenships for our brothers and sisters. But do you know what? I'm sorry to say this. Our people have suffered so long 
under the, what do you call it, post slavery colonial trauma syndrome. Many of my people didn't believe it. When I announced it, they said, Oh, my lion man, you, 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 you're talking nonsense. You're just trying to do self aggrandizement. Well, I said, No. Please come forth. And we were at Dr. Campbell's conference room, the Institute of African Studies, when we had the final call to tell them, this is the final call for you to come forward. And if you do, no matter what your number. But the majority just could not believe it. It was something that never happened before. And they thought we were just talking nonsense until December the 28th came around. And they saw the 34 walking down the aisle getting their citizenship. Then the masses who had said it wasn't going to happen started saying, hey, tell I need to talk to you. How can I get mine, man? I made a mistake, but look, put me in that number over the next. You know, so the long and short, uh, this is what had happened in 2016. Now, let me underpin this, and I'm going to stop a moment for us to take a breather. The What we have coined the 2016 citizenship, which was the right of return. And the right of return was so profound and resonated all over the global diaspora, even to Australia. We had people calling from Australia who wanted to come. That during the election of that year, the particular government that was in power lost and a new government came in. And of course, the new government, and we give we give respect and credence to His Excellency, that that particular the president Akufuado picked up the mantle and named it the year of return. But I want everyone to understand here that there could not have been a year of return in terms of the consciousization of our people globally unless they had heard of the right to return. And that right of return, all, all in sundry knows that when the right of return actually happened, it, it created in December of 2016, the 28th of December, 2016, it created a tsunami, like a nuclear fallout. I'm telling you, Facebook, Twitter, you know what I mean? Uh, Instagram, they all were on. And we had one of our sisters say she had 5 million requests that said they wanted to come to Ghana. This is in 2016 to get citizenship. So I want to say this, as I said in my closing on this point, that the right to return that took place on the platform of the Institute of African Studies gave impetus as a queen mother to the year of return of 2019. Thank you very much. And I'll stop here and see whether there are any questions, et cetera. All right. Um, and also, so this is one thing. There's a proverb that says, when your brother is on the mango tree, you need not worry about going hungry. And the idea is that for us to get citizenship, Dr. Maulana, as you saw in the short video that uh, I know Sister Julia has shared with you uh, before, that he got his citizenship back in 2013, correct me if I'm wrong. So he could have just said, well, I got mine later for everybody else. And he could have decided, I'm just going to sit underneath the coconut tree and max and relax and, you know, I'm done. However, he was very clear that it's not enough for just he himself as an individual to get citizenship. But again, to frame it in terms of a right of return, the right to return of Africans from the diaspora. And I think that this is what's so powerful because when he decided to seek me out at the Institute of African Studies in 2015, we had the sister, uh, Dr. Beverly Booker, right? Yes. She came with her uh, group out of Long Beach, University of California, University of California Long Beach. So they came and, you know, we were talking about various things. We were talking about xenophobia in South Africa. They were talking about the killings of black people there, the lynchings that go on. And, you know, this is something that has come up again with George Floyd, so forth and so on. That, you know, it was an exchange that helped us to understand, you know, basically as black people in the diaspora, it's basically like shooting fish in a barrel. We're basically like at any point in time, they could decide both police and private citizens 
could decide that on a whim they're going to shoot us down, right? And this is a situation. And then also on the continent, until we're clear that we're all one people, then we're also going to continue to suffer. And what um, Dr. Malala mentioned just in terms of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, he set up the Institute of African Studies. I want people to go online and search the African genius speech, the African genius speech, because this is a speech that he gave at the founding of African Studies, the opening, the official opening of African Studies. And I wanted to quote, he says, but you should not stop here. Your work must also include the study of the origins and culture of peoples of African descent in the Americas and the Caribbean. You should seek to maintain close relations with their scholars, such as us, uh, so that there may be a cross fertilization between Africa and those who have their roots in the African past. Now, this is one thing that, you know, even when people are talking about 400 years, this is a narrative that everybody's working with, right? Year of return, so forth and so on. But one thing that we did is that we showed that even if you go back, even if you only want to deal with the United States of America, you can at least go back to 1526. And you have the revolution at Samuel Will de Guadalupe, and everyone can search this out, that these were Africans who were enslaved by the Spanish in what they refer to as Spanish Florida, right? So there in Spanish Florida, those black people were not having it. They rose up in the first rebellion, the first successful rebellion and revolution, and they drove the Spanish out of Spanish Florida. Now that's not the state of Florida, all that land in Southeastern United States, they refer to that as Spanish Florida, and San Miguel de Guadalupe, that's in what we now refer to as South Carolina. All of that was considered Spanish territory. But what this shows us is that just like, you know, Dr. Maulana said, yeah, people who want to, uh, you know, put down the numbers, oh, it's 12 million people, that if you start at 1619, then maybe you can cut out some of the numbers. But once we actually do the research, we realize that the Portuguese were sent by uh, Dom Henrique, right? Prince Henry is the navigator, 1441, right? And you have Lázaro Freitas who was sent down there and with explicit instru instructions to raid and to enslave and kidnap black people. And what he did, he first kidnapped a black man and a black woman and then took them back to Portugal, right? And they were enslaved there in Portugal. Again, 1443, you had Africans who were again taken by the Portuguese and Cape Verde, not the Cape Verde Islands, but the actual Cape itself, they were enslaved and again taken to Portugal. So again, you have to start our count long before 1619. I know this is a narrative, but if you want to dumb down the numbers and say, oh, it's just 2 million, it's just 12 million, that's when you start with 1619. But long before that, by 1502, you had Africans who were taken to Hispaniola, right? You had Africans who were taken to Cuba, Right, so you had Africans there, and all of this is very well documented. I have several talks where I deal with this uh, in terms of the so-called 400 years, natural year of return, you know, things dealing with that. And I was actually put on national TV, GTV, which is a national television station, to go into this. And why this is so important is that when we even start with this date of 1619, this is where you get people say, oh, it's just a couple people who got sent over there. But once you realize that you have places like uh, in most now Mexico, right? You have 1570, you had Nana Gaspar Yanga, right? And that settlement is still there, 1570. This is long before 1619. So we have Africans in the transatlantic enslavement going long before 1619. But if you want to, you know, make the numbers go down, that's, and you don't want to deal with reparations, that's when you say, oh, it just started right here. It just started with the British. But long before the British, you have the Spanish, you know, over there enslaving African people. You have Paul Maurits, right, in the late 1500s, early 1600s. And you also have the Palenques in Colombia. People can look up um, the Palenque of San Basilio, the Palenque, right there in Colombia. And again, you have to go into the 1500s. And again, I have various talks, so I want to just rehash all of this. But what's so important about this, more than just giving you so many dates, is that when you have, uh, especially white people who don't want to deal with reparations, much less do they want to deal with repatriation, this is where they start off our narrative from uh, 1619. Because again, you had a treaty signed within uh, Colombia, uh, and you had, with this treaty being signed, they said, okay, we're just going, we can't defeat you, 
right? Again, this uh, Palenque is just like the Quilombos in Brazil. We can't defeat you, so we're going to sign a treaty just so that you all stay where you are. And that Palenque is still in existence. There's a, a great documentary by uh, Dr. Kemet Shockley where he goes into uh, the history of the Palenque there in Colombia. And all of this is long before 1619. Now, we've been focusing on transatlantic, but I also want us to understand Africans, Black people who are enslaved. I'm not dealing with any people of color and all this other stuff people are talking about. I'm talking about Black people. That you have the CDs. By 628, you have the Arabs who are enslaving Black people and taking them to India, right? And you find the enslaved Africans still there, taken from what they call the Zanj Coast. Anytime you hear Zanzibar, you have the Zanj Rebellion, right? And there, that was there in the 700s. And these are African people who had the first successful rebellion of enslaved Africans was not even in the Western Hemisphere. It was in the Eastern Hemisphere in what is now modern day Iraq near Basra, right? And those Africans were so fearsome that they were able to defeat the Arabs and then establish their own settlement, what they call Maktara as the elect city there in what's now modern day modern day Iraq. So this is so important for us to know that if you start off our date at 1619, then this is basically going along with these white people, right? These British and whoever who want to, you know, dumb down the dates and dumb down the numbers, that even beyond the British, you have the Arabs who are enslaving us. And you have the Indo-Aryans in India who are enslaving us in the 600s, in the 600s, a good thousand years before 1619. And then even long before that, you have the pixels, what are called the Hakao uh, Hasut. So if people are interested, they can read Josephus Flavius as he cites Imahu Manetho, M-A-N-E-T-H-O. And Manetho, what he says is that you have the invasion of the Abu. These are those in southwestern Eurasia, what we now would refer to as the Arabs, so forth and so on, the Bedouin, so forth and so on. And what he documents is that when the Hyksos came in, that they led into slavery, the black people who are there, and that they were ever more eager to extirpate the indigenous of the land of black people, that is Kemet, right? So it's very important for us to know this, that this isn't a recent thing, right? Some people are gonna say, oh, it started with capitalism, then they started calling themselves white people, then we started calling ourselves black people, but this is straight fraud, because we've been calling ourselves black people ever since Kemet, which means land of black people, where we call ourselves Kemet's you, which again means black people. So there is definitely a debt to pay, and that debt is not just to the British, right? Even though they're definitely included, it's not just to the Portuguese, but we do not have friends, as not a John Henry Clark told us. He said that we have no allies outside of the race, and we have very few allies even internal to the race, but all of this is coming back to this idea of the right of return. So I just wanted to give some background information just so that we don't start off with 400 years and then we dumb it down and then we just say, oh, it started there, Jamestown. Uh, it wasn't even at Jamestown, it was at Point Comfort, right? That's where the ship disembarked, disembarked. And it wasn't coming from Jamestown, Ghana, as some people are saying. It actually came from Rwanda, right? And what's now modern day Angola. You know, this is right uh, at the forefront of Nana Nzinga and her people were the ones who were enslaved and they were actually headed to Veracruz. So all these people who are saying ADOS, 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 that ship was headed to Veracruz. It wasn't coming to the United States of America, but due to some privateers, they hijacked the ship and they enslaved some of those. They recaptured, they already kidnapped black people, and then they took them and traded those black people for victuals. So if you want to deal with all the foundational black Americans, so forth and so on, those black people at 1619, they were even set to go there. This means you would have been cutting and excluding them just because you know a, a pirate was able to steal that ship and take them there. But I digress. All of this is coming back to what are we talking about? The right to return. And all of that started right there at the Institute of African Studies. So we had Founders Day, and that's coming up again on the 21st of this year, uh, what they're now calling Nana Kwame Nkuma Memorial Day. We won't go so deep into that. This is internal kind of politics, but we'll just uh, set it on that. But in that year of 2015, we had a major meeting with Dr. Maulana, you spoke, where I spoke, several other people spoke, and it came to this idea of why do we have to wait 
for the 21st of September before we can start dealing with these issues? We said we shouldn't have to wait. Why do we do that? And the idea came up is that we should have monthly meetings at the Institute of African Studies. So I wrote to then acting the third professor, uh, Dodu, and he, you know, signed off on it that we should have these monthly meetings. Now, this was something that went on. So that was September, the very first one we had in October. And then we had again in November, we had so we had come rain or shine, just like as Dr. Maulana was doing at the Du Bois Center, right there at the Institute of African Studies. And this was a significant platform because again, given that background and context of uh, Nana Kwame Nkrumah's African genius speech, he's not just talking in that speech about those who happen to be on the African continent. And he says in the speech, and I want people to go and read it, he says, this isn't supposed to be an Institute of Ghana Studies, nor even West Africa Studies, but your studies should go and make the links all throughout the continent, but your studies should not stop there, right? And that's the section that I read for you already. So what we did is that we had Africans coming from throughout the globe. When we had those meetings right there at the uh, Professor Enrique Odote Senior Common Room, we had Africans from Jamaica there. We had Africans from Haiti there. We had Africans from Ghana there. We had some coming from Congo. We had coming from, coming from Benin. We had coming from Nigeria. We had Africans from Canada. We had Africans all throughout UK, all throughout the entire world coming to those meetings that were so powerful. And those videos are still online. People can go and just do a search for Ministry of the Future. But the most significant one of those meetings was the one that happened in April. And that was the one where Dr. Maulana invited his good friend, Ni Kwesi Kwate, who's now deputy chair to the entire AU, right? And at that point in time, he was executive secretary to the president. So he came and he listened to what people were saying, you know, because up to that point, you have things like Emancipation Day, right? So we come, all right, we're talking, we have Panafest, we have a festival where chit chat and so forth, but we're just tourists, then we go back. But with this, what came out from that discussion is we don't want just some, you know, thing as beautiful as this may be. And I don't want to make light of any of the efforts that have come through, because that's my colleague, uh, Professor A.C. Southern and Addy, who was at the forefront of this. But what we said when we're speaking for ourselves as Africans from the diaspora is we're not just looking for tourism and then to feel good about our roots and reconnect. Then we go back to build the right nation. What we want is citizenship. And what this, did, what this does is it gives us roots. It enables us to actually be here. So if we build a factory, then that factory is something that can go and be passed on to our children. This is something that we can create jobs. This isn't begging for a handout. Nobody here is making a handout or asking for a handout. And we have Africans who come here and establish restaurants. I know of an African who came here and established a diamond cutting business here. I know those who established SNCC, right? So SNCC, this is basically the social security that is the biggest in the continent, right? And established right here in Ghana by Africans from the diaspora. In New York. From New York. My wife, she uh, interviewed an elder who came and worked on the ships for the Black Star Line. Not the original one from Donald Marcus Garden, but the one that took inspiration from that, that Donald Palmer and Cuba established. And this is an African out of Trinidad and Tobago who came and he worked on those ships so that we could actually have some of that visionary, um, you know, idea come into actual practice. And she interviewed that African right there. That's uh, Nana Sunny who passed away not uh, so long ago. But what we said is that we want citizenship. And with citizenship, not only can we ensure that we're bringing our labor, we're bringing our talent. When I finished my PhD, I won the Vice Chancellor's Award for the best PhD in the humanities. So this means I'm not coming here or whatever. This means that creme de la creme, right? Africans of the diaspora are coming here because what we do when we're there in the United States, when we're there in the UKKK, when we're there in Canada, what we're doing is we're building the white nation. So now we shouldn't be surprised when that white nation rains down bombs when we see hidden figures and they're going off into space and so forth and so on, this means that the black people are doing everything to build that white nation, right? And this is part of the contradiction, the internal contradiction that's going on there is that as long as we're there in that nation, all we're doing every single time we do nothing but pay our mortgage, what we're doing is we're financing our oppressors because they're gonna take that same mortgage money every time we pay our taxes on April 15th 
they're going to take that same money to build the prisons that are going to enslave our people. Because that's the article that uh, Dr. Maulana referenced. It was Legacies and Impacts of the Transatlantic Enslavement. And really what it goes on to is that you can't say legacy until you're talking about post. I know some people talk about post-slavery, post. I'm like, where is the post? Because right after the uh, 13th Amendment that enshrined enslavement into perpetuity, where it says that slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within these United States of America, they say United States of America, except where the party has been duly convicted of a crime. Well, guess what? That is when they decide to say all black people are criminals. Because every time it's time to pick the cotton, there's a there's a crime wave, right? <laughs> because y'all gonna be picking the cotton for free. This is what they call convict leasing. And I want people to look into that convict leasing system. Immediately after that, it became such a scandal where you had, you know, basically you had uh, some of these uh, wardens and prison guards. They said, this is better than slavery. What they said is, oh, with slavery, you have to uh, take care of them even in the off season. But they said, this one, all you got to do is go arrest one. When you work him to death, just go arrest another one. So there's a, uh, you know, people can look up worse than slavery and slavery by another name. And all of this is very profound for us to understand because they just changed the name. They switched to sharecropping. Then after that, they uh, switched to debt peonage. Now what we got going on is the uh, prison industrial complex and the privatized prisons. But what all of that amounts to is black people working for free. They're going to change the name but you're going to be working for free. So that's one side of the enslavement. But even those who are outside of greater confinement in the prisons are still working to build the white nation. And then they take the exact same money from your car note. They take the exact same money from everything you do. You just want to drink water. You just want to go to the grocery store. And then they buy the bullets that are going to shoot down your children in the streets. They take that exact same money from black people who are financing this enemy, financing this oppressor in order to rain down bombs in Africa, through Africa and so forth and so on. So what we decided is that we, what we need to do as black people is repatriate. And when we do so, what we're doing is we're building the black nation. And once we build the black nation, that is the nation that is going to be strong enough. If you if you uh, plan on appealing to them and say, oh, you know, just tug at your heartstrings and have some violence, please stop shooting us down. That's not how it works, right? But once you are able to build the black nation, look at China. They built that nation to the point that they're able to stand up. And now people ain't pushing around China because they know China has the capacity. They got what you got. I'll just leave it at that. So I just wanted to put a little bit more of this in context. I see we have somebody on the line as well. But I wanted to put some of this in context in terms of why we are doing the work that we're doing so that we can get citizenship. Because once we get citizenship, this means that we can be here and instead of building the white nation, which is what we've been doing for well over 400 years, right? What we can do is that we can build the black nation. And as Nana Malcolm X said, that no African anywhere in the world will be respected until Africa is a world power, right? When you see George Floyd and you see a knee on the neck, there's no repercussions for that. But once the black nation is strong enough, then guess what? There ain't gonna be no knees on the neck because they know one knee to the neck. And what I always say, and I'll pause on this, I gave a talk entitled, what those who think black lives really matter can learn from the original white lives matter movement. So what you'll see is that one single white person is killed, they'll have a race riot and kill every black person in sight. And that's how they convince us that white lives matter. If you look on the continent, the Wakikuyu would kill one single white person in Kenya, and then they go on a punitive expedition and they bayonet or shoot every single Kikuyu that they can get their hands on. That's how they convince black people that white lives matter. And they did a very good job of convincing us of that, right? So they didn't go around with billboards, oh, please. What they did is they established the power so that if you take one single white life, you're going to feel that white lives matter because one white life is the equivalent of hundreds and hundreds of your lives. Just look at Rosewood. Look at Colfax, Louisiana. We can go through it. I, you know, that was my undergrad degree in so-called African-American studies. I call it African anti-American studies because all of my ancestors were like Nana Nat Turner. They were like Nana Denmark VC, Nana Gabriel Castle. They weren't waving no flags. They were saying, we're taking that thing down and we're going to wave some that lets you know this is the black flag that has risen. So I, I think we'll pause on that note, but for people who are interested, I've seen this go across the screen. Dr. Maulana is Ministry of the Future. Look him up, Ministry of the Future. 
me, myself, I'm repatriate to Ghana.com. And I have a hard stop at 7 p.m. Ghana time because I have somebody who signed up for a consultation so that she could repatriate herself. And I know that we got thousands of people who are online. I know some of you are serious. But what I would say is that a lot for a lot of people, this is just entertainment, Dr. Mala, I'll just be honest. They want to hear somebody who's going to say something, rah, 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 get some woke, conscious knowledge, and then they're going to keep building the white nation as they're doing. But there's one single sister at seven who signed up. And I said, one African who is making a move to repatriate is the equivalent of a thousand people who this is just entertainment. They just want to hear some rah, rah, oh, yeah, 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 that was good. Now let me go to the next channel and look at some more videos to support YouTube and keep them running and you know supporting the white nation. So I think I'll pause on that note. We got somebody on the line, Dr. Maulana. Yeah, uh, uh, before the other person coming, I'd just like to make one comment. Uh, because what we're talking about at this point here, what is the way forward? The way forward. Right. Now, uh, Dr. Campbell and I, we've given you the, the narrative of how the citizenship movement in Ghana for Africans of the diaspora came into being. And uh, in the 27th of November, uh, 2019, see, it hasn't stopped here at the 34th. In the year we turned, we, we still continue. 126 Africans of the diaspora on the 27th of November, 2019, got the citizenship. And Ministry of the Future was in the forefront of pushing that. Now, as I talk to you right now, Ministry of the Future is taking applications. We are going before this year ends and definitively into 2021, we are pushing also for more Africans of the diaspora. Ministry of the Future is pushing and has a, a compilation of applications for Africans to get their citizenship. So I just wanted you to know the way forward because this is a very, very critical time, especially in the West, the United States of America. It's not to say the United States of America. Look, you have to understand, you don't understand by now that America is no longer the country that she wanted to be. And America can never be what she feels that she could be, whether it's Trump or whoever. Everything is coming down. And you have to really ask yourself, do you intend to go down with it? When your mother here in Africa, in the Garden of Eden, paradise, where we even have three growing seasons, the soil is so rich in Ghana. Are you going to come or are you going to go down? And my advice to you, you know what I mean? You make your decision, but I think now is the time for you really to get serious. You and your loved ones, I know you just can't uproot yourself and just go. My advice to all of my patrons that we're dealing with around the world in the diaspora, I tell them, even though you have not come to Africa or Ghana, but Ministry of the Future can help you. What you should do initially is that you take a visit, come and spend two to three weeks here. Housing is no problem. We will help you with that. You don't have to be stuck in no four or five star hotel. We got guest houses here. And you can shop around and you get people like Doc and myself. We are Ghanaians. You know, we, we are from, from your tribe, if you will. But we, we are Ghanaians. So we can give you the right narrative to tell you what you need to do. You must come here. Don't come here whole hog and say, I'm gonna buy it. Don't do that. Don't come here and just drop money. Come to visit and, 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 and help us to be your ears, your eyes, your ears to look out for you. And then you go back and then you get serious to say, now I'm going to make that leap, a permanent leap. This is my recommendation. So we're going now into uh, Ghana is into a very, very heated election year. And when you're into a presidential election year, things do not move fast. And so uh, uh, that is in terms of citizenship and all that. But even though we still are pursuing with applications to get your citizenship, but we're about to enter 2021 and things are happening. Big things are going to happen in 2021. My advice to you, the way forward, now is the time for you to make your decision. Thank you. I think we have somebody who's on the line here.
I'm just, I'm just seeing your image there. Did you have a question or comment that you wanted to bring in? If not, okay. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah. Greetings, Barry. Yeah. Let me do the official introduction. We, we, felt, like we, um, we felt like we were orphans. Sister Julie, we felt like orphans. We didn't hear from you. Do you know what? Um, a, 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 we forgot. We forgot. <laughs> Not name names. Hi, A. Say hi, A. Put the lights on. Put the lights on. Can you put the lights on for me? Sorry, it's getting dark here now. So, I, I yeah, I want to apologize firstly um, for the um, unreliable stream. We um, forgot to update the um, internet. <laughs> <laughs> Today's Sunday, and so yeah, we had to uh, do a lot of fiddling around. <laughs> so apologies, but um, firstly, I want to thank both you and uh, Dr. Milana for being with us today, Dr. Cambon and Dr. Milana. You're dropping facts, information, and knowledge, and this is what we need. So I have a question that I'd like to ask. I'm going to try and get the other people who were waiting to ask questions back on stream. So if you're waiting to ask questions, um, I'm going to put the stream live so you can ask questions to both Dr. Cambon and Dr. Milana. Now they are the pioneers. And this is my husband, Adrian, Dr. Milana, and Dr. Cambon. Uh, why don't you grab a chair? And so um, the person that introduced me to Dr. Milana is actually here as well, Luke, and um, also, um, Lord. Come, 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 come on, Matthew Hippolyte. Um, he has, uh, we're all part of a code, which is a council of African descendants here. So they're all here. Come, come on in. Hi, guys. Come on in. Come on in, Angela. And Angela, who is Luke's wife. So just grab a chair. Why am I torn off? Just grab a chair. I'm going to kind of move back so everyone can get in. I just want everybody to introduce themselves. So we're, 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 we're on the mission uh, with you. And we're inspired by you um, both. And uh, we're here in Gambia, you know, on, on the same mission, except for we're much earlier. <laughs> we're much, sorry, let's just say uh, we've got a lot more work to do. We're at a, a very early stage. So um, let me move over. So, Luke, Angela, introduce yourself. Come to the camera. Hi. Go forward, because I can't hear you. <coughs> Greetings, how are you? Uh, um, my name's Luke McKenzie from uh, the UK. Um, yeah, you can hear you. Okay. Um, I think we spoke. I think we spoke before with the Katora, Katora, was it? Yeah. Katora. Yes, with Katora, because I work um, a lot with Katora as on the sixth region as an ambassador, uh, and my wife here, Angela, she's an ambassador as well with the sixth region. So we are trying to um, do a lot of work with a lot of the different projects in the sixth region and, um, and in, in citizenship Guys, I'm, I'm and quite a few other this. things that uh, we're working on to try to unify and bring together the people from the diaspora to work with the people in Africa. Okay, can, can you hear him? Yes, yeah, okay, very good. well. Okay, yes. Matthew? Hi, um, I'm Matthew, Matthew Hippolyte. <clears throat> I own um, Hyperlink, Hyperlink Village Resort. Um, it's a resort that we set up, um, been here for around 15 years now. Um, we built it ourselves and um, we, we're running programs at the moment to help people with their transition into, into um, Africa from the diaspora. Um, you can find us online on booking.com, but you can also contact us directly if you need any help. Um, I've been involved with, you know, many different um, people in this country and people coming from the diaspora wanting help. So we're here, Hyperlink Village. At the moment, um, we have an organization here called Code, which is um, helping people who are wanting to resettle and I think we're all members of that organization and, you know, we're trying our best. That's what we can do, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we finally uh, have registered the organization here. So we're, uh, we're, we, we're a constituted uh, 
constituted group. But Angela is the treasurer um, of Code, and um, Adrian is the vice chair. Luke is the chair, and he's uh, in charge of the executive membership, and he's the head of the executive. And Angela is the treasurer. So go ahead, Angela. Yes, uh, like Luke said, it caused quite a bit um, about the situation. But um, as um, Juliet was saying, I did the banking code. And so for code, and that's going okay at the moment. We're trying to set up a partner. Um, so soon. So soon. Oh, it's so called soon, Susu yeah. Partner. Right. Same thing, anyway. That's right. And we just at the early stage at the moment, um, but it's going quite well. And we're really fine in it. I've um, been here four years in the Gambia um, and haven't and won't look back because everything here is everything here is what UK isn't. Um, we've got peace of mind. Um, and it's, it's the surround and the, the, the atmosphere is a lot different from the UK. Um, and my kids are coming at the end of the month. I've got two here. And five others are coming up the end of the month. And I hope that they'll settle in as, as we've settled. Oh, Wodemaya. Wodemaya, Yamaya. <laughs> hey, my brother Wodemaya, who is uh, the person that actually. Um, that started Black Sit is on the stream. So I want to send you an invite to join us, Wodemeyer, if that's possible. I'm just sending it on the stream. I'm going to put it on the screen. So um, I'm going to copy it and paste it now so that you can join us in the studio, please. I'm just posting it now. Oh, really? Isn't that amazing? So um, let's go back. Hang on. Uh, let's show. So if you'd like to ask a question um, to Dr. Malana or to Dr. Cambon, then please join. And in fact, I heard about Dr. Cambon through two people. One was Woden Maya because you did an interview on his show. And then the other person was Zena Craft. And um, yeah. Zena, I hope all is well with you. You're in my thoughts. And so, um, you know, I went to uh, Sierra Leone as a result of uh, Zena Crafts Company and Organization um, for Repatriation. So that has uh, really helped to inspire many of us. And Woda Maya, um, who has been, um, you know, covering and showing Africa to the world, um, has really inspired many people who had a negative um, ideology about Africa. Now I've got loads of questions. Um, one of which is for uh, you both, which is about what is the policy moving forward um, for citizenship in Ghana. Um, and one for uh, a question from us, which is in terms of code and um, the direction of us um, obtaining uh, citizenship here, the, the right of return and the right to return in the same way that you do would like um, some ideas and some tips uh, that you can share with us to create a strategy uh, uh, that can be as successful as you have been. Just so I'll, I'll touch on the code is Yeah, just real quick and big up to uh, what did Maya I hope to see you on the stream in a second. It's been a minute, uh, even though we just spoke, I think, about a week ago. Um, one thing in terms of the policy, we worked on a document myself, uh, Dr. Maulana and others in the community. Um, so this is about 2016, not too long after we got uh, citizenship and then going into 2017. What we realized is that it's not enough for us to get citizenship and the right to return on a presidential mandate or on the whim of whoever happens to be in power, whatever party that is because I got citizenship under NDC. Uh, my wife and others got it under NPP. And this was an initiative, again, that started at African Studies. So all of those forms were brought to me in my office, right? So that's where you know all of the forms were being collated. So I knew who was getting citizenship because you come to my office, I put it down. And then once that's done, I hand it over to Dr. Maulana 
he hands it to the executive secretary, it goes to the president, it gets moved on, and then this is how we got citizenship the first time. And then also the second time, you know, I'm making a bit short of it, but this was essentially a process, and it was through a form that Dr. Maulana himself crafted and created. And we had a meeting, when you look at the full video with uh, both Dr. Maulana and myself, we have a little short clip of that meeting right there at African Studies at the Old Block. And this is where we have people from all the organizations, AAAG, GCA, for those who are in, uh, not in Ghana, African American Association of Ghana, Ghana Caribbean Association, all of these different organizations, they were invited to that meeting, they were at African Studies, and it was told to them, and I wanna say that was October 2015, it was told to them that this is what's in the pipeline, citizenship, and you have people who are just, oh, that can never happen. We've been striving for it since the 90s. It's not going to happen. But those who uh, got a wise word to a wise one, they just filled out the form and said, it can't hurt. <laughs> and then that translated into the 34 getting the citizenship. Those who didn't get it the first time, we made sure. Again, I had the form right there in my office. So everybody who got citizenship, they know they came and brought that form. I had somebody I know from Cape Coast, my uncle's brought the form from all the Cape Coast contingent and right there to the office, right? So we decided that, and then that translated into 2019, those who were there, filled out the form, went through the interview process, so forth and so on. That's who got the citizenship. But both of those uh, were essentially through a presidential mandate that you know made that happen. But what we decided is that we actually need a policy. So we sat down to write a policy. We were using a shared document, we wrote a policy um, and that was in collaboration. And that initially, this was um, the work of the Center for Migration Studies right there at African Study, um, at University of Ghana, just two buildings away from African Studies. And we went there, we saw them, we spoke to them, you know, what's going on with the citizenship. And then we gave them input. And one of the things that we went through was that as it stands now, the policy is that Africans of the diaspora the descendants of the transatlantic and trans saharan and Indian Ocean and Red Sea enslavement of Black people, that all of us, we have to stand in the same line as the British who enslaved us. we got to stand in the same line as the Lebanese who enslaved us. we got to stand in the same line that this is fundamentally unjust at its core. So that, you know, is, is not just to appeal to our emotions, but this is the impetus for us writing a, a policy and having input, I should say, into the policy that says, we don't want to have to go through the same hurdles as anyone else who is going through, you know, the process. We don't want to stand behind the same British, the descendant of the British man who enslaved us. We're behind him in line. They're saying, all right, you got to wait five years just like this guy. This is unjust and it is not right. So, you know, that's where it is. So what we did is we submitted that policy. Right now, it's with the Diaspora Affairs Office of the President. And we're waiting to hear word back from them because, again, once this is enshrined in policy, then whether or not the sitting president agrees or you know wants to do so, that this now becomes something that the parliament votes on. And now every year, all of you who are online right now can apply, go through the process, and get citizenship. So that's where we are right now. We saw something in the newspaper that there's a multi-pronged approach. So that's what we did, and that's where we are so far in terms of the policy. That would be a blanket policy for all Africans, Black people of the diaspora, descendants of enslavement, right? Transatlantic specifically, but then also we know that there are plenty of Black people who are enslaved by Arabs, so forth and so on, that we're talking about descendants of enslavement by all the Eurasians, wherever they may be. So that's where we are. But then we saw something in the paper that somebody else is working on an act, so they want to also do it. And I'll say that's fine, that's beautiful, right? Because if our policy goes through first, then great job. If your act goes through first, then great job. But the whole thing is not about self-aggrandizement, as Dr. Maulana said. It's about getting the job done. And those with the track record for getting the job done, Dr. Maulana and myself, that those who got citizenship, the 34 who got citizenship, would not have gotten, and I'll say this, would not have gotten citizenship if not for this man right here, Dr. Maulana, right? I myself, I wouldn't have gotten citizenship in 2016 if not for this man right here, Dr. Maulana. But then this is in the spirit of reciprocity that that platform of Ministry of the Future, that that would not have been able to operate as it did without the Institute of African Studies and me working at the Institute of African Studies and opening that building up because it's very difficult to get a diplomat who's the executive secretary to come 
and listen to what Africans of the diaspora have to say without the backing of an institute with a reputation and that is held in high regard. You can't tell them, come sit underneath the tree with me and let's work out a major deal. Still laughing right now. Still laughing out of the park and you're trying to meet him in, right? But with African studies, this is the reciprocity. We opened the platform. Dr. Maulana brought the idea that this is how we should go about it. And we moved on it month after month, right? So I see somebody writing that we need an African passport. This is also what we're working towards as well. There's an AU passport. And those who have ECOWAS passports, those who have Ghana passports, can upgrade them. This is the idea to the AU passport. And I saw somebody wrote something about the sixth region that as it stands now, the sixth region is an idea, but what we have to keep in mind is that all five regions, every citizen of any country of the five regions on the continent has voting rights. However, Haiti applied to join the AU and they were rejected in 2016 because of 29.1 of the AU's constitutive access, only African countries can you know, be part, be member states of the AU. And what that tells us is that even if there is a sixth region, but no member, no citizen of any member state of that sixth region has voting rights. This means that the Arabs who are enslaving us in Libya can vote. But those of us in the sixth region who outnumber those in Libya, we have no vote. We have no locus. We have no ground to stand on in the sixth region. So what we need, if there is going to be any sixth region, is that it can't be a bulldog without teeth. We don't want to be part of a sixth region and we can finance a Wakanda village somewhere, but we can't be actual member states because according, so basically what this comes down to is that the very constitution of the AU will change, will have to change if the sixth region is going to be anything other than the diaspora can be an ATM for those on the continent, but we can't vote. It can be taxation without representation, and that's really not good enough. So those of us who are working on policy, who are writing policy, like myself, like Dr. Maulana on the ground, you know, it's very good that we got citizenship because this means that we actually have a voice in the affairs of the country that is listened to and has been listened to. And I'll, I'll pass it over to Dr. Maulana. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to do a take off on what Dr. Campbell is talking about. Coming back to getting citizenship, uh, that is the importance. Uh, we're talking about the sixth region, mm -hmm. and the sixth region really, you know what I mean, you don't have voting rights. Exactly. So that is why. We need to get more of our people over here to get citizenship. Now, a moment ago, Dr. Campbell was uh, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, when I got my citizenship, I felt the need that the others should get it. Let me tell you, we should go in the spirit like Old Side Temple, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said on the 6th of March, 1957, at the Polo, Old Polo Grounds. He said, Ghana's independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total independence of the African continent. My citizenship, or Dr. Gambon's citizenship, is meaningless unless we get more of our people in the diaspora over here. And the more that we get here to become citizens, then we can, we can influence the bidding at the African Union because we're not only the citizens here, but we have the link to our brethren and our sisters and kit and kin in the diaspora. And that is why I think the paramount issue right now should be in your mind is for you to get to Africa. Get to Africa, crook or hook. Get here and then pursue getting your citizenship. And of course, like what Doc said a moment ago, uh, it should become, and this was, under, I mean, this is my understanding as early as 20, going back to 2001, uh, we, we were pursuing this is that we must get government to institutionalize by an act of parliament. Mm -hmm. It become institutionalized and enshrined in the constitution of the government of Ghana and for that matter, government of African countries. That citizenship must be required. There must be an avenue to give a number of Africans of the diaspora who are desirous to get citizenship. And let me say, what is important? It is very important for those of us who are on the ground here, and Ministry of the Future has this as a part of its mandate, that we must be able to set up satellite offices, set up satellite networks 
in all of the 55 Christian sub-Saharan Africa, Black Africa. Well, you have one in the country, you have one in the uh, Senegal, you have one in Guinea, you have one in Guinea, you have one in, have one in Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, all along. So that we can influence, and this is the way things are done. And look, <laughs> I mean, you got to play, I'm sorry to say this, we got to become diplomats. We have to learn the diplomacy on how to court government. And government is there. And you know, you can't do anything in a country unless you can have some kind of door open to that sitting government. And so we have to learn in the modus operandi on how to deal with them. And I'm saying that to say, the more of our people that we get here, the new citizenship, then we can form a nucleus, a block, so we can have educational outreach, we can have advocacy, if you will, for the government, and the government will put us as a part of their state protocol. We will become part and parcel of the state protocol. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me highlight what I'm saying in that. It's not enough just to come here and get your citizenship and just go roaming about doing your one, two, one, two. No, 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 no. We must not only get our citizenship, we must establish what I consider to be a mini, M-I-N, our embassy, a business uh, that is an African diaspora, a business development cultural center. We must have a cultural center, a business center that is represented, representative of our presence in this country. And we can be registered with each one of these business development cultural centers with the sitting government. So the sitting government diplomatically will acknowledge us. And in these business development cultural centers, we will have such a complex, like a, a, a big embassy. We have a secretariat working 24 seven. We will employ uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the indigenous people, if you will, of the, of the area in with the diaspora. We will be one together in that secretariat, in that business development cultural center. And I'm saying that to say, we need such a center that has educational facility where we can teach our people the language. You got to learn the local language, learn the culture. We need a business development cultural center where we can have guest rooms, a self-contained compound, about maybe 10 to 15 different uh, self-contained compounds. So when our people are coming, particularly those who are coming with children, and we're going to have many coming with their, with their kids. They, uh, you, you, you will not get the full going into a hotel. We will have guest houses there that just a number of fees that you would pay. So we will be able to accommodate you. You will be there to do a transformation and rather than you just coming and going straight into the society, which is a no-no. And many of our people have had some bad experiences by coming to Africa and not going through a transformation, you know what I mean, a session. In other words, to be educated to what the culture is, educated to what the language is. And we should have at least about a week or two in this business development cultural center where we have educational outreach program to really educate our people. Because when you look historically, um, a migration of people to different countries, if you look at the Babylon, the United States, as you say, the United States of America, and for that matter, Britain and many of the other countries. When they brought immigrants in, they did not allow them to go direct from the ship or the airplane into uh, the, you know, the inner cities or into the inner part of the country. They had what they call educational centers where they could uh, you know, educate the people to the cultural mores, the language and things of that sort. So we need that. And the only way that we can get such an apparatus in place, we got to establish a business uh, development cultural center. That is paramount. If not, what is going to happen, what is happening right now, you'll find the governments will be planned upon us as a cash cow. We will be coming one one, and you know, you, you know, you have to get your visa renewed, or you have to get your this renewed, you have to tax on it. But once they know we are united, 
and that we have like an embassy that represents the African diaspora that is working in concert with the state house, is registered with the state house. And that simply means anything that government does, any dignitaries to come in to visit, you know, from different countries, if we give an invitation that our business development cultural center, the CEO and the deputies, whoever's in there, we give an invitation to sit with the president and these dignitaries that are coming here. And that's the only way that we can become effective by coming home. So I, I just wanted to highlight that because as we stand right now, things are moving so fast. In the UK, as you probably know, moving very fast, and they are moving very negative, very negative against the black race. In the United States of America, things are moving so fast, and they are moving very negative. So what we have to concentrate on right now is getting you here. That is the paramount issue right now, is to get you here. Once you get your foot on the soil here, you already have brothers and sisters who know the language, who know the cultural mores, who know what to do with the immigration law, know what to do with the resident permit to get you into the system. So that is my recommendation to you right now, is that we have to look far ahead and look toward, that is pooling our resources together and get a business a development cultural center. We must have satellite offices that are representative of us in every black African country. You understand? We must have a headquarters. And it will be at the headquarters in Banjul that is connected to the other 54 throughout the African continent or the headquarters is in Ghana. We have to come in as one. We cannot be and splintered all over the continent because in that type setup, we have no power. And you must understand, Africa is a collective society. It's been like that from time immemorial. Numbers count in Africa. Individuals, no. Numbers count. And we have to come as a number. And mind you, if you do not know, whether you're coming from Barbados, Jamaica, Brazil, United States of America, UK, the, the continental African only see you as a diaspora tribe. We are, we have been labeled as the new tribe. I'm not saying that I buy into the, uh, you know, tribalism or whatever, but that's the way it is. So that simply means you have to come here with the consciousness to understand that you're not coming as a Jamaican and think that you can front yourself and move about as a Jamaican or an African American. You come in here as African American, you want to front yourself within the society as African American. No. And this is why we need that business development cultural center so we can educate you to the Moray. Because if you do something wrong, you are not going to be looked at by the continental people as an individual. They're going to blanket the whole diaspora community and say that's the way they are, all of them. So we have to be closely knit. We have to understand our behavior. We have to be streamlined in what we do. We have to know the do's and the don'ts, where to go, where not to go. And your brothers and sisters like Dr. Campbell and I, we've already shown you the roadmap is here. The only thing you need to do now is to come and contact us so that we can pave the way for you to come here. I think that is my uh, recommendation. And, and just real quick, um, there's one thing that I wanted to speak to, and we're going to have to wrap up very shortly. I don't know if what am I still trying to come on. But there's one thing I want to speak to, which is just in terms of sometimes people bring up Liberia and they say, well, look at Liberia. When Africans from the diaspora come, then, you know, these folks don't get along with those folks and then so forth. And what I say to that is that this is really a scapegoat type of situation. And what that situation was really about was the blood diamonds. You have to look at the role of France, the De Beers diamond cartel operating through Houphouet Boigny and Cote d'Ivoire in order to host the rebel groups to go into Liberia, so forth and so on. And anytime you see a conflict on the continent, what we need to think about is what are the resources that are the source of that conflict? Because what our non-black enemies do is they'll, they're quick to pit one group against another group as they laugh all the way to the bank. And the reason why I bring that up is because there are plenty of conflicts on the continent 
that have that exact same recipe of there's a resource there and you see black people fighting. Meanwhile, you know, our non-black enemies, they steal the resources and laugh all the way to the bank. If you look at Southeast Nigeria, there is oil. There's no scapegoat of Africans from the diaspora to blame for Southeast Nigeria. But what you can see is that anytime you see black people fighting other black people, there's some resource there and you have Royal Dutch Shell and so forth and so on in there and they're laughing all the way to the bank. If you look at Eastern Congo, over 10 million black people killed, not just by Leopold, but right now since the late 90s in Eastern Congo around Coltan. And again, that's about the resource. There are no Africans of the diaspora to blame and say, look, 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 they came from, no, 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 that's not the situation. What it is that there's a resource and what they'll do, they'll do just like they do with the gangs, blood versus script, where they will pit one group against another group. You see the spillover with Hutus and Tutsis, again, fomented by France, fomented by Belgium, so forth and so on. And there's no African of the diaspora to pin that on. If you look at South Sudan, it's about the oil that's underneath that ground right there. If you look at Northern Mali, right, you have these uh, rebel groups in Northern Mali. That is about the nuclear interest that France has in Northwestern Niger. So if you're not aware, I just want to set the record straight because people are like, oh, we're so afraid, look at like No, this isn't about a Liberia situation because I'll give you 100 conflicts on the continent and there's no African of the diaspora to blame. But what it comes down to is that they, they will pit one black group against another black group while they laugh all the way to the blank with, with all the way to the bank with that's blood diamonds, blood, blood coltan, or whatever. But what I would like to highlight what Dr. Baolana said is that it behooves us to look at ourselves as one, Africans of the diaspora, and as connected to Africans of the continent. Because until we do that, then they will pit Africans of the diaspora as a super tribe against Africans of the continent, and they will laugh all the way to the bank as they steal our resources, as they have been doing for hundreds of years. So again, I just want to frame that in that way. And I think what Dr. Maulana brought up in terms of that business and cultural center, basically a virtual embassy, is a visionary idea. And what that can do in terms of the synthesization is just let people know, well, what about London? There's, there's no scheme for what's going on here. And it can help us to frame things correctly so that they don't play one against another as they steal our resources again. And that type of educational outreach, that type of cultural outreach that can happen through such an initiative, which is really what you know, Ministry of the Future has as a vision, what we patriots in Ghana has as a vision to assist others to be that liaison. For me, I speak the indigenous language and I teach it at the university to Ghanaians. So who else is better to assist you in repatriating to assist you and understand the culture. I'm installed as a traditional ruler. And that was that happened due to my understanding of the culture where the people of the community took my side over a native born Ghanaian because I respect the culture. That guy considered himself a pastor and all of y'all are savages and pagans and heathens. They're not gonna take that guy's side even though he's born on the continent. So once we understand the culture, once we understand the need to integrate with our brothers and sisters, because we are all one. That's what that red, black, and green flag you see behind me is all about. That is what Nana Marcus Garvey's vision was. And that flag was unfurled for the first time 100 years ago in August, you know, to this year. And I think Dr. Mala has something. Yeah. And for me, I would say that, you know, we'll have to close it out very shortly in about five minutes. But I'll hand it to Dr. Mala. Yeah, let me so. just build on what he said and come back to what I said before. You see, you have to realize, and it's the same um, thing in the end. People who want to ask questions, they've been waiting a while. So I'm going to put them on to answer you directly, okay? So I'm just going to remove uh, myself. Are there any questions here quickly before we go? Luke? Um, Angela? Matthew? Yeah, you know, let, let me just, uh, Julia, let me just interject one point, which is extremely important. I forgot to mention. One of the most important things that you're going to have to do in the Gambia in Ghana, wherever we come. We, due to the fact, you, you have to understand that the indigenous people are brother and sister in here. They have a village and they have a paramountcy. And the paramountcy is indicative of the fact of where they come from. Now, obviously we don't have that. And so in these different paramountcies, they have cultural displays and festivals festivals that they have every year to highlight 
this particular ethnic group, the importance of the group in that in the fold of the nation itself. We of the diaspora, we must establish festivals. And uh, we in Ghana, the Ministry of the Future has already done it. We have two. And I, and I suggest that you look at that, that you get integrated into uh, the uh, the paramountcy there within the Gambia uh, as a part and parcel of the nation, where every year you, you pick out an important date that the diaspora in the Gambia, just like here in Ghana, we have a right to return festival. Doc knows that. We have the return baptism at Asim Manso, and then we will have display, economic display, meaning economic exposition that can go on for three to five days, bringing in the best skills and talent of our people to put it on display before the nation. That is a part of the yearly festival that we have. And I say that all of the African countries of where we're going to repatriate, the repatriates that is the diaspora, the African diaspora, will have to set up and integrate oneself into the fabric of that country by having a festival that is uh, the epitome and the indicativeness of who we are as a people. Because otherwise, if you do not do that, the masses of the people will still be mystified. Why are you here? What is your purpose of being here? And this, this is why you have festivals. You have the festivals where you go three to four days and have, you know, we're education of aura. Uh, all of this explains in the festival that this is the festival of the diaspora, of people who spent 500 years in captivity. They come from here and they're having this on display. So I'm just saying that is the part that I didn't mention earlier, but I think you need to really integrate that into your coming home. Right. And Sister Juliet, I think we have like one minute or two, uh, but we actually have a sister who is looking to repatriate and she uh, will be waiting for me. So we'll have to sign off very shortly. Sister Juliet, did you have something else? Um, yeah, just a couple of guests have got questions that they wanted to ask. We're having a home in January, so I just wanted to let you know that we are going to have um, a homecoming festival here in January. We've taken your advice and uh, we're organising something and uh, uh, it's been organised at um, Hyperlink in um, January. So, um, so Pirate Brain wanted to talk to you. And um, Empress Thank Ebony you and, and Anne Marie, and me as well. So they've got questions, quick questions before you go. Okay. Th thank you very much. And I appreciate all the information that you two gentlemen were giving out. It's really useful information. Um, I have a question. Uh, you said, and I've heard a lot of people say that, uh, yeah, you should just come visit the continent. And I think, you know, a year ago, two years ago, that that was a, a very valid point. Um, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to do that back then, but I'm planning on repatriating to the Gambia and I'm setting up my finances, um, selling the property and all that I have to do that. But I don't think in this time that we have the luxury to come visit and then go back home and then come back again. I think it, it, it's a situation where is when it opens up, we we have to get out. And I'm thinking, do you advise something like that or you think that's a bad move? No, I, I would just like to say, it depends on the conditionality of the individual. Like you said, things are getting hotter, much hotter and difficult where you are in the States. And if the window opens, go for it. Go for it. Yes. I would say the exact same thing. Go for it. And this is really when we say that we're here for you. So this is the service that Ministry of the Future provides. This is also what Repatriates and Ghana provides. Because you want advice from people who are successful repatriates. So I came to the continent, and that's where I got my PhD, right? At the University of Ghana, again, the award for best PhD in humanities. After that, the best publication in the humanities. After that, the Donna Marcus Mosiah Garvey Award for Excellence in African Studies and Education. At the same time, you know, uh, installed as a traditional ruler. 
So you don't want to take advice from people who uh, have tried to repatriate them, they failed, they can't do it. So these are the services that we offer. So what I would say, reach out to Ministry of the Future, reach out to myself, uh, repatriate to God.com. I think that that's flashed on the screen a couple of times. And what we do, we'll sit you down, we'll explain the process to you. When you go to the homepage, one, you'll see the video that myself and Dr. Marlana uh, did together. But then on top of that, what you'll see is a repatriation readiness questionnaire. And with that, we'll ask you questions in terms of what is your intention on coming to the continent? What type of area would you like to live in? Are you looking at the mountains? Are you looking at the coast? Are you looking at the suburb? Are you looking at the city? What exactly are you looking at here on the continent? Uh, in terms of are you repatriated by yourself or with your family? That all of these things come down to the specifics of the consultation, the consultation and the advice that you will get. Because someone who's repatriating solo will be different from somebody who's coming with a family of six. And what I always tell people is I know people who've come and repatriated and they fail and they end up back in the United States driving an Uber, just trying to get enough money to you know build the wall that fell down because they got a jack led contractor that they and I'm like, rather than doing that, I'm, I'm, that's an actual story. I'm not going to tell you any name. But I know the person who had that exact situation. But you don't want to do that because what are you doing by enriching Delta? So what I tell people is that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So you need someone who's done it correctly, someone who has done it and excelled at being a repatriate. And now this is the person who can assist you. There's a proverb in Yoruba, one of the languages I speak here on the continent, which says, which is someone who falls into a ditch, teaches everybody else wisdom. But why should every single African of the diaspora fall into the ditch? And then they're, oh, I guess I shouldn't do that. Then somebody falls, oh, I guess I How about you get it from people who did it right the first time? Like, I haven't set foot on United Snakes soil since I repatriated I was back in 2008. Dr. Malala has been here since, what, 87? 87 on the continent. So you need it from people who actually know what they're doing, not people who fail. But I think on that note, I'm actually in my second uh, repatriation consultation that I have. So in terms of the question, what I would advise is people hit us up, repatriate to Ghana.com. The short <coughs> URL is r2gh.com, just as you see on the screen. Dr. Maulana, to reach you. Uh, uh, you can reach me. First of all, I've been on the continent since 1972. Hmm. I've been in Ghana since 1987. Right. You can reach me at uh, 0547. 916-329. I'll repeat that. 0547-916-329. And of course, that's Ghana. And contact us, as Dr. Campbell said. I mean, you know, you want to deal with people who know the roadmap. We have the roadmap. And we're not doing this. Uh, we're, not, we're not chasing money. No, this is, this is from the heart. This is the vision that we have. So please understand that. And, and what I want to say just on that point, Dr. Maulana, he was arranging meetings with the executive secretary at a very posh hotel that he's paying out of his pocket, right? All these Africans from the diaspora, they got citizenship. They go, oh, this is nice. They don't know, you know, us going there to open with the key that I got, Institute of African Studies, and, you know, so they can come in. They don't understand the sacrifices all for free for year after year after year after year. Three years. But in the spirit of reciprocity, what you do is that when you come to us, you let us know how we can help you. And then what we do is that we allocate time. I have a family of six, myself included. I have a family all together six. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set aside time for you, right, where I'm not going to be dealing with I got university stuff. I'm a traditional ruler at FYP I'm going to set all the things that I have to do professionally and personally aside to work directly for you. So repatriate to Ghana. All we do is ask you how you want me to help you. If you don't want me to help you, if you want to come yourself, that's cool. We know people who've done it and succeeded. We know a lot more people who've done it and have not succeeded. But we don't want to give you any horror stories if that's what you want to do. But if you want our assistance, we who have gotten... Um, who have gotten citizenship for over 150 Africans, we who have succeeded in repatriation. If you want our professional assistance, then we're here to help you. If you don't, 
that's cool. This is not a gun to your head. We're letting you know what we're here to do to help you. And I'll pass it to Dr. Yeah, Mel. I, I just wanted to build on top. You see, let me let me say this, uh, brothers and sisters. And I believe those who are in the Gambia may have some inclination and understand what I'm about to say. This is a different culture. I, I, you know, in the way Africa is right now, look, <laughs> there's no free lunch. Of course, they say there's no free lunch anywhere in the world. But I will tell you this, and I'm not pointing the finger at any particular nation or any particular individual. But in order for you to get things done in Africa, you had better be prepared to grease the pump. Do you know what I mean when I say grease the pump? A dash, a dash is, is, a, is a centralized factor. So it takes money here to move things. And people are not, you know, the others, they got their citizenship, like Doc said a moment ago, uh, they, they, they got it on a, a freebie. They got it just on the goodwill of us, a sacrifice that I made, he made, we made for three years. Money's coming out of my own pocket. Having to jump in and out of taxis, running to the ministry, and you don't just walk into a minister's office just like that. You got to get past the secretary. You got to get past the chief director, director, officer. And it costs money to do these things. So I just wanted to tell you that the way Africa is set up, you know, I'm not saying that uh, it's the fault of Africa, but the way the European colonials left Africa and the way that they are milking Africa today, it has forced the African to try to compensate compensate for that deficit of finance. And so you find it in all sectors that you won't get anything done unless you can dash. Because the person will drag their feet. They will tell you, go and come. Say, oh, I came to get my papers. And when you come to get your papers, they say, oh, uh, the, the CEO is traveled to the funeral and he'll be back in a couple of days. He said, what? Uh, the minister, he left. You know, so you have to be aware of these things. All right. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to have to close. I see one of my, you just came in, a couple words, but I do have to close my money on the line waiting to start the session. But Black Tassie, to see you online again. We did a powerful interview. I'm still seeing people commenting on that interview from like a year ago. And yeah. it's all been picking up. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Uh, my mom, I do. What do you want, bro? Yeah, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, you know, hey, you know. hi. Hey, cause you Yeah, me huno, me huno. Yeah. Good evening. I hope, I hope, I hope everyone is fine. I don't even know what to say right now, but I just want to say, um, Julia, thank you so much for having me in here, and it's good to see, um, Dr. Cambon again, and um, so Dr. Mulana. I hope I mentioned the name right. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I just got to know you today. I just got to know about him today. So the whole of today, I was actually reading about him. And then I found out that he's here. So I just wanted to come and say hello to you. And uh, I'll be coming to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and we look forward to a, a follow interview, right? I see the, Yeah, uh, definitely. Definitely. The definitely. So, all right, but on that note, we're going to have to sign off. I know, Sister Juliet, you may continue to move forward. What in my yeah, uh, it's definitely black tasting to see you again. Uh, yeah, it's a sunshine, but can't cheat. What's it? Yeah, every time we're on Casa Nay, I'm gonna have to. Aha, bye bye. All right. <laughs> Hi, Juliet. Where, where, where is the host? I, I'm not the host for today. I, I just came in here to say hello to each and everyone in here. Thank you so much for supporting the Black City YouTube channel. Juliet is really doing an amazing job. And like I said, I always feel proud to see what Juliet is doing, connecting Africans on the continent and Africans in the diaspora together. It's time to come back home. It's time. It's time for each and every one of you to come back home. Black City. Do, do, you have, do you have a slogan? Do you have a slogan? <laughs> I'm new. Say hi to everyone. Hi. 
Keep up the good work. Wow, the, the family is growing. Yeah. <laughs> this is a um, part of African descendants. Wow. It's an organization that um, we all co-founded uh, to create, a, if you like, like a reception for um, anyone coming back to Gambia to repatriate. Hmm. So they come to an organization. And so what we've done is we're now getting organized so that we can put um, all the essential elements that are needed and important in terms of your repatriation in place. So like Matthew's got the venue and we'll be doing all of the um, seminars, yeah? Um, Math, um, Luke is the chairperson and um, Angela is the treasurer and um, my friend there is looking in. I'm not going to say his name, he's not exposing him, <laughs> but he, he's flown in uh, and uh, come to, to Gambia to check out repatriation and he's, uh, you know, um, uh, let's just say got himself a piece of Gambia because of you. Because wow. of you. Yeah, the, the, the revolution is really happening. <laughs> The revolution is really happening. Like, I, I feel so happy to see whatever is going on. And uh, I'm so glad that we set up this whole YouTube channel so that people can connect with um, Africans from the diaspora who are actually integrated back to um, the Gambia. So, you know, thank God I did this thing. Thank God. Uh, thank you so much, Juliet. You know, I don't know why, Juliet, where are you? I can't be the host of your show. You are Please, Gillette left me here. If you can see me, say hello. Gillette left me here alone. But anyway, I think she's having problems with her internet. Um, she left me here alone. But um, to each and everyone in here supporting Gillette, please continue supporting Gillette because I met Gillette in person. I set up this whole YouTube channel that you're saying. And um, the way Gillette has taken this whole YouTube channel to the next level makes me feel so happy. So to each and everyone being part of this family, the revolution is happening. Don't just go to Gambia. Those of you who are only thinking that oh, Gambia is the only country to go to, not just Ghana and Gambia, Africa, the 54 countries. So I think uh, most of you can take a visit, visit any African country of your choice and think of which country do you want to relocate and stay there permanently. Yeah. Um, where is Juliet? Please come and bear me on me. Juliet. Oh, my microphone? Hey, if my microphone, which means my internet, too. my internet is really not good. Forgive me. I don't know. I think it will be my internet. Ah, uh, my goodness. Where's Juliet? Uh, where's Juliet? Where's Juliet? Juliet left me here. Okay, I'm taking over the show. We cannot hear you. What? It's it's not me. No one is here. Gillette is not here. No one is here. They left me here. I, I don't know. They left me here. So, uh, oh my goodness, the volume is better. I don't know. They left me here. So I don't know what I'm saying. But anyway, um, your internet is fine. Thank you. We hear you. Water. The sound is okay now. Thank you so much. I'm glad that the sound is okay now. Now I take over. Yeah. What? What? Yo, you all welcome back to the Black City YouTube channel. Where's my guy? Hmm. Hmm. We can hear you very well. Uh, we can't hear you. Where is Juliet? Juliet left me here. Okay, so I think I need to read your comment because keep talking. Uh, I, <laughs> okay. I, I'll keep talking. I'll keep talking. Yeah, um, she left the show for me, so I think I need to keep talking. Um, what I want to say is that it's never too late to take a trip to the continent. I know a lot of us give up on the continent, but it's about time for us to look back. You know, we have to know where we're coming from. You might be born in the diaspora. You might be born in Jamaica. You might be born in USA. You might be born in the UK, but like I said, if you look like me, you're definitely an African. So you definitely have to take a trip. I mean, even if you're not going to relocate, just take a trip to any country of your choice in Africa. So I believe that the time is now. You don't have to waste too much time. Don't keep on 
um postponing that oh you will come next year 2021 2022 by the time we end up you'll be in 2030 and you're still not here most can't afford it no you know these are the things that i think nobody is telling you guys and then I, I i feel so bad when i see people commenting every day that you can't afford to visit africa i i don't know it's so cheap to visit africa it's so cheap to visit Africa, but uh, I think I need to show you guys the secret behind buying ticket, the secret behind um, the apartment that you rent whenever you come to Africa. Because I met a couple in Ghana today. Juliet, you left me today. Okay, so listen, I, it's my stream. Blame it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Um, so I, I, I met an African American. Uh, I met an African American couple today. Just today. They actually staying in the estate that I'm living in, which is so expensive. But these guys just go to Ghana, and I was like, "Wow!" And when I saw me, they were like, "They are in Ghana because of me." And can you believe that they are staying in the same estate as me? But this estate that I'm staying in is super expensive. I am not the one who is paying, by the way. It, it's a subscriber who paid this place for me. But I believe that if you are relocating to Ghana to stay in a place like this, is really expensive. But because they don't know anyone, they just came and decided to book um, this place and live here, which is kind of safe, I think, um, for the first start, it's safe. So I think they made a good investment. But uh, we need to make things easier so that people, um, we need to make things easier and affordable for everyone to come visit, you know, which states are cheap to live in Ghana. And one thing that I noticed is that everyone want to stay in Accra. You can't, you can't be coming to Ghana and you want to stay in Accra. You can go to Akosombo, which is so cheap to live there. You can stay in Kumasi, which is way cheaper. You can stay in Takrade, which is way cheaper. Move beyond the capital cities. You know, but I think almost the entire African diaspora, whenever they visit Africa, they want to live in the capitals, which I think it's not the right decision to do. Yeah, Vota region is even there. You can stay in the Vota region. Do you have, have festivals in Ghana? Definitely, we have festivals in Ghana. Yeah, I stay in that place, sixty-five dollars a night. That's too much. Yeah, really expensive. Very expensive to live in a place like this. <laughs> it's late in Accra. That's why I know Accra is late. But uh, you can literally come to Accra for some time, but don't come and stay here forever. You know, this is how it's supposed to be. But since the um, Black said, can you please come and bail me? Oh, what happened? What happened? Oh, my goodness. That's not too rigid. Ah. We need more videos of affordable areas in Ghana. I'll try my best. I'll try my best. It's not easy. It's not easy to do this kind of videos, but um, I'll definitely try my best and do it. Yeah. My laptop is literally going off. You see, um, thank you, communion. Where, where is Juliet? When I go to Africa, I want to move around. Yeah, cities have internet similar standards, just like the West. No, but but when you live everywhere in Ghana, you definitely have internet. All you need to do is to get a good package and you're good to go. Yeah, it's not like only the cities. Uh, what state do you live in? I live in Takradi, but now I'm in Accra right now. Yeah, it's working. Oh, yeah. Are the borders open right now? Uh, yeah, the borders are open. The borders are open. The Ghana borders are open, but um, you have to pay one fifty um dollars for COVID testing. That's another thing that I've found out that it's so expensive for so many people. Yeah, but yeah, you can you can really check it out. You can really check it out whenever. Um, I think, I don't know if most of you know It's Love Migrates, who lives in the northern region of Ghana. The northern region of Ghana, it's more cheaper. It's one of the cheapest places to live in Ghana, even though I've never been there. But the people that live there are saying that um, it's really cheap. All you need is the internet and you can make a living. That's it. Where is Juliet? My, my laptop is going off. Oh, my goodness. Where is Juliet? Yeah. 
Black said, what events are you having in January? I want to let people know. Yeah, $150 for testing. What? You see, this is what I'm talking about, Africa. That's why. Um, why 150 It's uh, for, for me, I think it's 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 really ridiculous to charge that amount of money. I can't win. 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 I well, Gillette left me in here. Do you guys have any questions? Let me reply yeah. because I think Gillette left me. I just I need to take over the show. It's all my shows. I didn't really know what was going on, but um, ah, it's still costly. Yeah, very costly. Yeah, very costly. Mm. See, if if you haven't if you haven't subscribed, sorry, sorry. So why so much for testing? I, I really don't know. This is like um, the government's rules and which I really don't know what I'm going to do about it. Are you going to do a video in the northern region? Um, the northern region, I don't want to go there right now. I want to go to the northern region when there are so many activities going on. Yeah. But for now, because of COVID, nothing is really going on at our place. So that's what I'm waiting um dr molana and Tamboni were talking about repar repatriation yeah so um you put it in the the, the so can you bring your COVID test from your can home country yeah you can bring your COVID test from your home country but when you get to ghana you still have to apply again you know so it's like you need to have two COVID tests uh from your home country and also in ghana a laptop is going off in one minute. Oh my god. Oh, it's Julian. <laughs> thank, ah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Rona Maya. Uh, uh, Julian, my, my laptop is going off. Thank you. I was like, very oh, much. Uh, <laughs> hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome, Juliet. Juliet, I just want to say, I just want to say that you're doing an amazing job for real. Like, I'm really, really proud of you for what you're doing and what you're achieving. Like I've seen so many people relocating back to the Gambia because of you. And you know, right now there are a lot of YouTube channels popping up in the Gambia, which is incredible, you know. And um, thanks for the inspiration because I know the inspiration came from you and no one else. Um, so yeah, it's a whole new revolution that Charlie, 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 Charlie. It's it's a whole new revolution that you've created, and um, I, I think a lot of people are following, which is a good thing. We need more people to talk about Africa. We really need more people to talk about Africa. So for me, I'm so happy to see whatever is going on. I'm so happy to see. <laughs> I can is hear you. In the my like, I mean, you, can you hear me? Yeah, that's I can hear you. Yeah, there's so many people in my room. Oh, that's why you can hear so many um, noise at the background. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, oh, my God. Hey, they left the show for me again. Eh? Okay. I'm coming to Ghana next month and I would love to link up with one of my uh, next month. I think I'll be in Nigeria. So I'll be in Nigeria. I'll be in Nigeria next month. So when I when you're coming to Ghana this month, you definitely see me. But next month I won't be here. Yeah, I won't be here next month. I'll be in Nigeria next month. I feel you guys do more for the continent than the political leaders. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Why have they left the show? I think they're having a problem with their internet. So that's why they're having a problem with their internet. So that's why I think, um, yeah. We, we love you, Otomai, for showing up how beautiful and great Africa is. Thank you so much. Um, will you be in Ghana during Christmas period? Of course, I'm always in 
during Christmas. I'm not going anywhere. I need to spend time with my mom. Lady Visionary, I see you. Uh, what am I? Are you getting many consultancy requests? I've not actually talked about it, but I still I get requests. I've actually not talked about my consultancy, but um, I still see people um, requesting. I think at 8 p.m. today, I have another one today, 8 p.m. Yeah. But Amaya, you're an engineer. Why are you into using your skills? You know what? I'm not going to be the first person to design an airplane. There are people who are actually doing it. Uh, I just want to be creative beyond the whole um, Western education of you being an engineer, being a doctor. I think I've started a revolution that is really making a whole lot of impacts. So I believe in finding your purpose than words more than being an engineer because you can check on the internet stuff um type what am i and you see a lot of things popping up so yeah maybe when i go retirement on this whole youtube journey i'll go back to my engineering career but for now i don't need it thank you what am i are you still with your lady yeah of course why not um that Fred Maya, you're bigger than that. Eat love my great. Hey, eat, eat. Hey, you keep on eating, you keep on loving, and then you keep on migrating. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's love my great. I've missed you. Hmm. Um, Jalof Rice is delicious. Um, we love Juliet and her family, but Black is should try and support support business owned by continental African people too. Okay. Came to Ghana in 2019 to 2020 because of you, Watermaya. You see, that is the kind of testimonies that I really want to hear, you know, uh, people visiting Africa because of me. I mean, this is the impact that it's worth more than being an engineer. So, yeah, I really want to do what makes me happy. I mean, see people visiting Africa. Like I said, so many pastors pray to win souls for Christ, but I will win so for africa africa needs each and every one of you and um i see it happening so i'm not gonna give up anytime soon we gotta build a continent your engineering skills is needed yeah there are so many people who are building the continent i'm not gonna be the first one i'm doing my part i can do everything so yeah i believe that i'm doing my part so which is good i'm doing my part right now um there's not maybe my part is not the engineering my part is what I'm doing at this very moment, so don't expect me to do everything. Thank you. Um, I'll be in Gambia next month. I can't wait. Yeah, so Sky, I want to come to Ghana too. Okay, definitely Ghana. I wait you. True, what am I? There are better, cheaper regions than Accra. Definitely. Um, Audrey, my sister, the question was for what am I? He answered, I beg. Okay. Hey, what am I? Will you be getting to Nam Will you be visiting Namibia? Definitely. I'll be visiting Namibia very soon. Yeah, very soon. I think COVID has actually messed up so many things. So we just have to wait for a while and then we see when next we can travel again. I just uploaded a video of uh, uh, a man who never had a university degree but managed to build over 2,000 apartments here in Ghana. So you just maybe you just might go and check that out to know that you know you don't need all these um, university degrees to become successful in Africa. All you need to do is to start something right now. And um, with hard work and dedication, trust me, you can make it. I constantly watch you, Black Seed, Daniel Boyd, do, okay. Yeah, I like the stream, no talking nonsense about the problem of Africa. Kiwi, what am I? You're doing great. Thank you so much. Um, This is your calling right now. Obey the ancestors, what am I? <laughs> Juliet, I took over your show. Yeah, I like it. I love it. Uh, Anytime. Yeah. <laughs> Where's ES? Yes, yes. I don't know where she is. I think she's she's so busy right now. I yes, where her. are you? No. Yes, yeah, she's she's in the show. She's yeah. in the chat room. She's in the chat room. Yeah, I just, I just uh, posted the stream so she could uh, she could join you because I know she wanted to say something. In fact, um, in saying that, um, someone from the um, 
African network was trying to reach you as well, Imani. So I'll send you his uh, contact details. Uh, he'll, Imani, African. Um, yeah. He's searching for me? Yes, yes, he called me. And also you do. Juliet, there's so many people. There's so many people that are looking for me. Oh, I mean, right now I'm even tired, Juliet. I mean, just talk to them. Tell them to talk to you. It's okay. Tell them to tell everything they want to tell what I'm to you, and you will solve it, Juliet. Please help me. Uh, okay. It's too much for me. Just, you just solve the issue. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, definitely, Julia, definitely. It's not easy. I mean, the work is too much right now. Um, you know, the new, new new content that I brought lately, it's actually taking turns, ar turns around, and I can't even control the way people are reaching out to me lately. So it's it's really difficult. So please, if anybody reaches out to you and say you want to speak to Wadamaya, please do, do that for me. Just tell them. They should tell you everything, and then you're going to summarize it for me. But I'm loving your content. I must confess, I am Thank loving you. the content. It makes us feel so proud to be Africans, you know. You. And the thing is, you're showing. A lot of people talk about, oh, there's not this on the continent. Oh, Africans aren't doing this. Oh, these people are coming here and they're doing that. But you're showing, like, mm. yes, actually, there is a solar panel um, factory. And actually, yes, you know. There is this hospital. Actually, yes, we are making our own chocolate. Actually, you know, and so I mean, I'm loving it, and I'm I'm kind of following in your footsteps. Mm. In way. I'm hoping to interview Ja Oil Malik from Ja Oil. You know, I, I I think I think what the content that I'm creating right now is what we need for almost every single African country because I was thinking even coming back to the Gambia to try something like this again because I never. You know, this is just COVID-inspired content because I felt like so many people never believed in Africans. Even Africans never believed in themselves that the other people that are doing something like this on the continent. So bringing such content, oh my goodness, if I tell you the messages that I receive every day, people are saying, wow. So we can also do it. We can also make it on the continent. We don't have to go to the West for them to tell us that we are inferior and all that. Like people are doing incredible stuff in here. I, I was so blown away moving around Ghana, seeing what Ghanaians are doing. I mean, I can't wait to uh, travel other part of Africa to do exactly the same thing. We need to showcase all these things to the world. You know, it's about time. So maybe, wh where is your junior brother? Jill, where is your junior brother? Um, sir. Yeah, He's maybe, maybe. And Osman Torre, he said to say hello. Yeah. He's in Rwanda now. Yeah, I follow, I follow. Seth, how are you doing? Seth, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm great. I, I got a task for you. Why, why don't you start doing, why don't you start good. creating a YouTube channel to how promote African businesses in the Gambia? Sir, can you hear me? Okay. No. Okay, I see can what I can me? do. We need, we need, eh? Does that sound like he's going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you have to start. Help you know, him. Africa, yeah. I'll Gambia, help Gambia, him. Gambia needs this kind of content. Juliet, you know, we, we have <laughs> to put in this kind of content over all over the continent. You know, people need to you know, know that. Know. Yeah, I couldn't even stop. <laughs> <laughs> he, kept, he kept quiet. Yeah, I know. He kept quiet. I know that he doesn't want to do it, but he can't try it out. Oh, oh definitely. I mean, we interviewed like quite a few successful people. And mm. I want to do more. So, what I'll do is I'll let Steph do. <laughs> I'll let Steph take over. But we are looking to do interviews with the um, CEO of uh, QCell. Uh, which is the telecommunications company here. They also own QCity and they also own QTV and oh. um, other um, big conglomerates they own and also Jet Oil. Those are two companies and Jet Oil also do cement. They have petrol stations and they also do gas and oil 
and they're Gambian owned. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really kind of proud as I'm looking around, I'm seeing more and more uh, companies uh, that are up and coming and that are African. So there needs mm. to be more African companies on the continent. There mm. needs to be um, far more investment, I think, far more investment um, on the country. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to say I something? Think, I think Oh, okay. <laughs> They're chatting away. I wanted to know if they want to say something to you. I thought I was just asking a question. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I think it's time. You know, I think it's time. The time is. Yeah. No, what I say I'll say is that I'm very yeah. proud of you because I've seen you on your YouTube and for a young man, um, at your age to be traveling and doing all that, you make us proud, and we you need to get many more apprentices like yourself and teach them <laughs> of how to promote themselves and promote Africa. My man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're trying our best. It's not easy, but we're really trying our best. I think Juliet is doing more than I do. So I just ah! want to say I'm more proud of you, Juliet. No, 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 Juliet, Juliet, take the credit. Juliet. <laughs> Juliet. How's your sister house, Miss Trudy? How's your mom? How's your uh, baby? little baby nephew yeah everyone is fine Juliet everyone is fine my mom is doing well Trudy is awesome and uh yeah the baby boy is amazing I mean like I'm now I have a nephew right now so this is like my son yeah yeah so my son yeah he's my, my son right now so I mean you find out I I, I will, but Juliet, I'm just waiting. I have one request. You know, you've been in Gambia for so long, you know, so I don't know if I, I, I just want to say this in here. If you think Juliet should visit Ghana, type eight. Juliet, you need to you need to come and visit us in Ghana now. You've been in Gambia I'm for coming. so long. We need, we need to we need to see you in Ghana. I'm I'm coming to your event. I'm coming. I would uh, Dr. Arakana, Dr. Arakana, she invited uh -huh. me to women's um the women's conference in Ghana on May the 2nd, but the borders were closed, so I couldn't come. But I'm definitely, definitely, definitely coming to Ghana. I've wanted to come to Ghana for years, and each time something has happened to block my journey. The first time the airline went bust, <laughs> and then the second time the borders were closed. I don't know if they're trying to tell me something, but you know. <laughs> We're, we're, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you in Ghana. We're waiting for you in Ghana. I was supposed to. I was supposed to have um, a meeting. Coming to your wedding. <laughs> no, no. My, 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 my wedding will not be hosted in Ghana. Definitely, it will be somewhere in Africa, a destination where everybody can fly in easily, but not in Ghana. We're coming to the wedding, all. We're coming to the wedding, all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but that, that's that's awesome. I, I was supposed to have an interview with Dr. Arikana today. I was supposed to have oh, an interview. Oh, 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 oh. You supposed to have I an have, interview with Dr. Arikana? Yeah, Arikana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to have an interview with her, but um, I just wanna um check the time and date and everything. You know, I just jump on your live like in. Just wanted to see you and say hello. Because it's been long since I talked to you. That's why I came in here. Yeah, brother, Mr. Edgar, I'm good. Yeah, okay. So when you come in Gambia? Uh, unless you guys invite me. If you send me the invitation, I'll come even tomorrow. Anytime you're ready, you're welcome, Wadamaya, your family. Yeah. You I, I, Just come. <laughs> Just come back and come. You have a home uh, here. Uh, definitely. I'm coming. I'm coming. I told Juliet to prepare my room for me i'll be coming very soon yeah, because yeah. i think yeah. i think i think you need a second coming of Odomaya, the second coming of Odomaya in the gambia yeah. <laughs> juliet yeah. i didn't see that everyone is starting yeah. eight you build, you build that house for you, Odomaya. what he, he built the house outside you see he has what am yeah i've seen it I, the I house outside it. has what am on the door <laughs> I saw that, Dylan. I'm coming very soon. Thank you so much for yeah. that. I'm definitely coming. Uh, so, uh, listen. <laughs> I'm listening. We're coming. 
Definitely. Listen, tell Dr. Zarakana, I've mm -hmm. been waiting since January, yeah, <laughs> for okay. my interview. So please remind her, the Black City interview. Okay. Yeah. Eugene Talford from uh, the Diaspora and Think Tank in New York gave me her details. We chat, we did everything. I sent an email. We had a great conversation. She invited me to Ghana to the, to the women's event. It was fantastic. We've even been on the same show. That the yeah, interview hasn't I mean, landed yet. So please remind her that Julia is really I mean, keen to talk to her. I mean, please. I want to I mean, talk to her and Akon because I like what Akon is uh, 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 planning to do. I think he needs more black investors, more African investors. Because I think that um, there's a lot of Chinese um, in Africa at the moment. And there's a lot of every other nation in Africa at the moment, but there's not enough diasporans coming and putting their investment in Africa. So we need to do it because I'm telling you, if you think that, that we're the only people that are on a mass exodus, you'll be mistaken. Um, even in Europe, people are leaving and um, they're actually coming to Africa and people that are overlanding, um, people that are flying. And um, there's loads of talk groups on um uh, Facebook and other platforms with loads of groups that are leaving and permanently coming to Africa. So we need to come permanently, you know. Um, how many flights have we been on, Age, where there's only a handful of black people and the rest are all white people flying to Africa? It, it's, it's becoming um, very, very frequent. So one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that we're the people coming home and we need all the governments like we started at the beginning, you know, to open the doors for automatic citizenship for us when we come home. We, we, we need to work together because um, what's happening with this uh, colonial pandemic um, across Africa and their plans for Africa is serious. It's serious, mm. we're living in perilous times and it's time for us all to unite. Everybody, uh, all YouTubers, all influencers, you know, we have to get on the pan-African tip and we have to, now um, start, you know, unfolding Marcus Garvey's dream and uh, making it happen where we all do it in love and respect with each other. Very sure. important, you know, we're living in perilous times and people in, in I, I got a friend of mine here who's here from the States right now and he was telling me how bad it is in New York, how terrible it is in New York and that, you know, it's, it's like living in a, a, um, a military state. So, you know, state sanctioned, um, genocide is going on um, globally for us. I, I was. Juliette left me here again. Oh my goodness. But then, what Juliette is trying to say is that it's time for each and every African out there to make Africa home again. That is what Juliette is saying. I want to summarize it for you guys. It's time, or the time is now. Right? For me, I just want to tell each and everyone out there enough of the complaints, enough of always talking about Africa's problems, enough. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I had um, the problems of Africa. And I grew up and I also started hearing people talking about Africa's problem. But when at all are we going to continue complaining about Africa's problem was we need to find solutions. Like I said, it's about time. Each and every one of you out here should play a role in solving Africa's problem. Even though we don't have the support of the government, I'm going to say it over and over again. I mean, these are the things that sometimes I say. Uh, people really don't understand. I mean, we won't get the support of the government, but if we come together collectively, we can do our part to changing the face of the continent. Because I've started my whole movement. This is a movement that I think it will benefit the entire continent. This is a movement that needs to be supported by an African government, but you don't get the support. You don't get the support. You have to do everything by yourself. But since you start doing everything by yourself, people also support you. So like I said, it's possible. It's about time. We need to help ourselves, support ourselves. And each and every one of you, you claim Africa once again and make Africa your home. I've seen Doreen in here. Doreen, a big shout out to you. This is not my channel, but I have to give you a shout out in here. I've seen uh, so many people who left, left me here and I have a meeting by 8 o'clock. Oh my goodness, it's 7.46. Uh, seven forty-six. I have a meeting. Juliet, oh my goodness. <laughs> ah. Okay. Oh. Okay. 
Omar will be a great tourist if he has to Omar go to school already. He keeps on saying he's building a school, but I've never seen any school. Until I see a school, that is when I'll believe to go to Omar Jones. After not seeing that school that he always talks about. After not seeing that school that he always talks about. So if any one of you know where the school is, you can just um, let me know. Definitely, I'd love to. I'd love to check that school out. So there's me, and I said, I believe in actions, not talking. All oh, this interned Pan Africans always talking, 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 talking. Always. I know I'm young, but I'm not, I don't fear to say all these things. You know, enough of the talking. They've been talking on the internet for so long. I'm just going to say it here. I don't know if you're a fan of, um, a fan of, uh, Dr. Umar, or a fan of Dr. Rikana, or a fan of Patrice Lumumba. Enough is enough. Enough of the talking. Let's see what is going on on the ground. You know, me, I'm just going to say, if I haven't seen a project that you've done, if I haven't seen a project that you've done, I will never support you. I mean, because people have been taking advantage of black people for so long, all in the name of Pan Africanism. You know, they've been, they've been taking advantage of black people for so long. I, I see it every day. I see it every day. You know, you know, oh, black, you're black, poor black. Oh, but at the end of the day, they're stealing from their own people. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> these are the things that people don't like hearing. Juliet, I mean, I'm saying something. You're I don't sure know. about that. Yeah, it's all right, Juliet. I have a meeting, yeah, yeah. but let me just, um, um, just I have a meeting by 8 o'clock, so I need to prepare. But anyway, let me just say this. Um, I just want to tell all the Pan-Africans out there is that, please, we need more actions instead of the talking. Now you're right. We need, we need, we need more actions <laughs> instead of the talking. Um, they call themselves pro-black, Pan-Africanism. Um, there's the 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 more people who... At the end of the day, okay. they do, Thank they you, do yeah. nothing. They do nothing. Thank you. This, and I just wanted to, like, I mean, I feel like they've been taking advantage of the blackness because, you know, everybody wake up and say, I'm Pan-African, okay. I'm pro-black, and at the end okay. of the day, we start giving them money, but they don't, they don't, they don't put into practice. They don't, they don't work what they are talking about. You don't see no actions. I've seen most of them and me, I'm just being real. Let's, if you are pro black, be pro black, but oh, stop talking about it. I am using Afri Pan Africanism every day without doing anything on the grounds. Juliet, you're doing an amazing job. I just want to say, keep up the good work. You know, you, 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 you changing the narratives. Oh my goodness, I'm going, Juliet, please. I have a meeting. No, oh my goodness, I have a meeting. <laughs> Juliet, don't leave me, don't leave me, <laughs> don't leave me, Juliet, don't leave me. I have a meeting. <laughs> Ay. I have a meeting, man. I have a meeting. Uh, huh. Please, eh? I can. What do you mean, what am I? Uh, no, I, I'm not. Please, I, I'm not trying to disrespect anybody. Let me just make myself clear. I want, I want Pan Africans with actions. If I see you doing something, that is when I will believe you that you are a real Pan African or you're pro-black or something. But you can't be staying on the internet and talking, 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 talking as if you know everything. You know, you talk as if you know everything, yeah? But at the end of the day, you're doing nothing on the ground. And there's so many people who keep on talking about Africa, 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 but they don't even, they've never been to Africa before. You know, but they say Africa, 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 Africa. Yeah. Who? <laughs> I don't have anything against Art Why? Why would I have any? Come on, I, I spoke to Atkati before. Why would I have beef with her? For what? Man, I'm I'm just busy minding my own business, so I have nothing against anybody. I spoke to her some time ago. Why would I have any beef with her? Um oh Juliet, please uh, if Juliet comes, tell her that I'm I'm off. I have a meeting, so I don't know. I just wanna I have like five nine minutes more to go. Yeah, so 
we want citizenship with actions to not to be used as ATM machine. I address this. I met the ex-president, the, the former president of Ghana. I addressed this when I met, um, what do you call it, the, um, the African Union, the African Union ambassador for the diaspora or something. I also addressed this. Me, hmm, maybe I think people have to get close to me before they know who, who am I. So uh, me, I'm beyond before. I, I turn blind eyes for so many things. But anyway, uh, please, I have to go. I have a meeting. So Juliet, please, I'm so sorry. When you come and see me, what am I is off? Thank you. Beef with Dr. Mumbi? Squash it, please. Dr. Mumbi? Beef? How? <laughs> How will I have beef with Dr. Mumbi? For what? Okay, so I need to go. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I love you all. Keep on supporting Juliet. And please, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please come and subscribe to my channel. 540,000 YouTube subscribers. So thank you. I love you all. Bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everyone for watching. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I'm